Um, I think we're going to start uh, so we won't lose time and we would have enough time uh, for discussion. I think yesterday was wonderful because we had so much time for discussion and we were able to all be able to speak. And so I hope we get as much time today uh, and thank you for those who came yesterday and came today, okay? Um, all right, today we start our, uh, our day two with uh, Islah Jad. So Islah, shall we, shall we start? Uh, thank you so much, Amira and uh, Ruqayya, for this uh, wonderful workshop. It helps, you know, to get together and reflect on our, you know, endless <laughs> problems sometimes. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my presentation today is about uh, the politics of domestic violence in the Palestinian occupied territories between uh, what I termed as global governance and um, local uh, strategies. In this paper, I argue that colonial power and global governance structures are defining the content and the strategies for combating violence in the occupied Palestinian uh, territories uh, for the purpose to gloss over uh, colonial uh, violence and um, stigmatize again culture and traditions as the only structure for uh, domestic violence and thus for women's oppression. Uh, in the first part, I will give an, a general uh, overview of the general context, and uh, this will be an integral part, you know, of the paper to understand you know, uh, the dynamics of global governance and the call for combating uh, domestic violence in Palestine. Prolonged military occupation and the pervasive uh, violence, is, it exercises, uh, remains the most defining features of po both political and socioeconomic realities for Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Daily life involves the regular denial of the most basic of human rights, whether going to school, work, or place of worship, seeking health care, farming one's land, maintaining family relations, or choosing, choosing where to live. Under the Israeli military occupation, Palestinians uh, face ongoing and periodically in intensified and large-scale violence, both overt and covert and permitting all aspects of life and leaving no safe heaven. This violence includes repeated, includes re, re, repeated military incursions, the destruction of life, property, and economic uh, livelihoods, continued forced displacement, and here I just, this is about the house, demolition, house dem, demolitions, the long queue for the seeking jobs in the early morning at four o'clock in the morning, this is settlements surrounding almost all villages and cities in the occupied Palestinian territories. This is the systematic destruction of olive trees. Some of them uh, dates back to 1,000 or 1,200 years ago, and the burning of olive trees that is the basic uh, economic, um, you know, um, sources for more than 100,000 Palestinian families. Uh, so detention and uh, complex and comprehensive regime of territorial uh, control involving extensive restrictions, restrictions on Palestinians' movement and access and leading to the consolidation and deepening of separation, isolation, and fragmentation of Palestinian communities. Understanding the gender dimensions of the resulting transformations in Palestinian society remains a challenge. Over the past 20 years in particular, social and economic life has, has been profoundly destabilized. And so two normative gender roles, relations and expectations as Palestinian households fell victim to ongoing destruction of their livelihoods and the absence of everyday security, many of the former roles and arrangements between men and women and mutual expectations linked to them were put under severe stress. 
This raises critical questions regarding the ways in which the intensity and magnitude of political, social, economic violence have led to the disintegration of previous gender arrangements and to uh, what uh, extent new ones have emerged in their place. Within this complex setting, a number of salient characteristics of Palestinian society today with significant policy uh, implications emerge. One, a high degree of external invention and, and, and low degree of self-determination uh, or autonomy. Uh, here, Israel, through its vast military bureaucratic machinery, continues to hold comprehensive and decisive power of over, over all spheres of Palestinian life. Through its control over external borders, the population register, added to its internal mobility regime, all aspects of Palestinian decision making continue to be determined by the limited horizons that Israeli power allows. Thus, on the political level, holding legislative council elections is dependent on whether Israel allows them. Israel can also simply dispense with democratic outcomes such as following the 2007 PLC elections when they imprisoned the majority of democratically elected Hamas and others representatives. On the level of day-to-day -day governance, both the West Bank and Gaza governments are incapable of under undertaking most of the basic responsibilities of government anywhere. They cannot decide who is a citizen or, or who simply enters or leaves the areas under their uh, sensible control. They cannot undertake basic protection functions with rights limited to internal and civil, and civil policing. Most aspects of economic planning, such as internal and external trade and economic development strategies are beyond their control. Land and natural resource policy uh, urban planning and infrastructure are all confined with the physical limits of areas A and B and C restricted to what Israeli allows. While totally vulnerable to Israeli intervention, Palestinians and their governments are also extremely vulnerable to international actors. Rather than carrying through their responsibilities under international law, <clears throat> to protect the occupied population, external actors have intervened, intervened primarily to affect the political behavior or determine the vi viability of the Palestinian leadership. Not only the government, but also all activism related to women's movement in combating violence. The outcome of this high degree of external intervention and lack of autonomy is the extremely narrowed is the extremely narrowed scope for Palestinians to exercise free will, independent decision making and agency. On the level of government, this is obvious. For instance, in terms of gender, government policy remains severely constrained, restricted to the limited areas of life and population under its jurisdiction, while simultaneously unable to freely prioritize resources for gendered ends, given its total aid dependence on international donors. But it is also true in terms of households and their members, many of the most basic decisions of life, like where to live, work, or study within their own uh, patrimony is beyond one's ability to freely choose. As much the most intimate life decision of who to marry or whether to have another child is often, often completely constrained by the crippling realities of residency requirements and movement restrictions. And dealing with limited life choices always involves uh, calculations based on gender, usually at the expense of the weaker uh, parties of girls and women. Second, a high degree of securitization without protection. At present, the West Bank uh, Palestinian uh, Authority security forces are composed of approximately 23,000 personnel, while in Gaza, the Hamas government has a separate force comprised of approximately 25,000 uh, men. This means a police to civilian population ratio of approximately 1 to 60 in Gaza and 1 to 110 in the West Bank. 
while in liberal democracies, the ratio on average is one to 500. Given that uh, even in unstable post-conflict situations, such as, uh, uh, as Kosovo, where the ratio is, the ratio is one to 4.4, uh, it is clear that uh, Palestinians have one of the highest police to civilian ratios in the world. Moreover, while unable to offer protection against Israeli aggression, the security services are also unable to provide the, pro uh, the protection of even civil policing to many communities, especially, of course, communities uh, like in Area C where the Palestinian uh, authority has no jurisdiction. The gendered implications of securitization without security are myriad. On the economic level, the security sector budget takes up the majority of government resources at the expense of health, social security, and education. Security uh, sector jobs are profoundly gendered, gender exclusionary. At the lar largest single employer within the PA and Hamas public sectors, it is almost completely close to women. And given that women's dress and behavior are often the prime targets of social policing, like in Gaza, the gender divide in terms of policing and socially policed is obvious. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, third, the shrinking space for public action, uh, domesticated public sphere. Israel control, uh, controls the narrow confines in which Palestinian public sector are uh, even uh, possible. Outside the um, uh, confines of Area A, public action, even when visibly non-violent, such as in the villages, for example, of Ni'alin and Bilain, or in East Jerusalem, has to contend with Israeli military brutality and bureaucratic sanctions. But within the confines of Area A and within Gaza, the space for public action also continues to narrow, partly as a result of the skewed nature of, the Pal of Palestinian securitization. Given uh, that the Palestinian security forces are neither able to, to undertake national resistance nor provide protection from the fundament fundamental threats to the civilian population, in both regions they have become even more focused on internally policing the population, be it politically, ideologically, or uh, socially. In the process in both the West Bank and Gaza, the public sphere becomes more and more uh, devoid of uh, space for public criticism of either uh, standing uh, government or their uh, policies, while particularly in Gaza, security forces increase increasingly, as I said, narrow the space for social freedom. Uh, fourth, growing social fragmentation and socioeconomic inequality. Over the decade, the separation of the occupied territories into, the th into three main geopolitical units has become institutionalized. Palestinians living in the Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the rest of the West Bank have lived in separate e economies and under vastly different political bureaucratic regimes. Uh, <clears throat> Given the ongoing enclavization in the West Bank, everyday lives, social and economic possibilities and futures are now vastly different depending on, on whether one lives in urban center in Area C, the Jordan Valley, or in same, uh, or, or, or in a same uh, zone community code between the wall and Israel. This means not only that life chances are increasingly determined by specific geographic settings, but that these process, uh, processes have led to Palestinian society as a whole becoming increasingly differentiated and unequal. And this is obvious in the statistics about the uh, occurrence of domestic violence where, in, um, where we can find that in areas besieged by the wall uh, or targeted by settlers, the level of dom domestic violence is much higher than in other area. For example, like the area in uh, southern uh, part of the West Bank in Hebron. The collapse of uni a unified national project and the rise of polarized uh, polity. 
um, perhaps the greatest uh, challenge facing Palestinians in, in, in nowadays is that collapse of their most hard-won and long-standing achievement, their unity as a polity under the national movement as, uh, and as represented by the PLO. The breakdown of the unified national movement into two rival governments can only be understood as a product of the various processes outlined above. But the collapse of the national movement is not just another outcome of these powerful forces that have succeeded in disinheriting Palestinians from their patrimony and national rights into the 21st century. Instead, a unified national movement is the fundamental precondition for finding a way forward and beyond them. And this is uh, important to understand how women and women's movement uh, left in a, a very um, soft and easy way the, the call for national liberation to a call for fighting domestic, uh, domestic violence. Uh, in this situation, how can we develop uh, uh, um, a clear policy for uh, gender uh, equity or gender justice in our areas? The above mentioned features of the Palestinian context hold particular implications for whether and how national policies can be developed. Setting policies requires first and foremost a political vision of how society should be shaped and organized. It requires a framework, an ethical foundation which shapes this vision. It is based on a policy agenda which is derived from uh, scientifically generated information and is underpinned by a collective, rational, and identified social interest. Usually, policy is developed by government with which espouses beliefs and values emerging from the democratic process uh, engaging the electorate and those in government. That is different policies from different, uh, uh, policies must be coherent. That is different policies from different sectors must be orchestrated together so, so that one supports the other and not contradicted. It must be based on the same belief and values. Why I'm saying this? Because there is like a chart with all Palestinian ministries and um, uh, these ministries and their expenses and the support of even their policy documents is divided on the donors, that certain donors will, for example, provide for the Ministry of Education, France for Education, uh, Norway for uh, social protection, uh, Italy for domestic violence, and of course, you know, uh, issues related to social affairs. So this made the situation to, 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 to appear as impossible to have a coherent set of policies, you know, uh, between the different uh, ministers. Understanding and addressing gender-based violence in Palestinian society is complicated by both too much silence and too much exposure. On the one hand, Palestinians and not only male perpetrators are reluctant to bring family and private issues to public attention. And this will be seen when I come to the statistic that over 60 uh, or 65 percent of, uh, uh, of uh, women victim of domestic violence, they choose not to speak up. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Palestinians and not only male perpetrators are reluctant to bring family and private issues to public attention or particularly to police and courts. A silencing shared by many other societies as well. On the other hand, violence against women in Palestine, Arab and Muslim societies had been framed and sensationalized uh, sessionalized by Western media and politicians and even deployed as reasons for military interventions such as in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Palestine itself, donor gender agendas and their funding interest in gender-based violence includes individual male violence but often seem to exclude the perv pervasive colonial violence in which Palestinian women, men and children lived their lives and sometimes made their death. Internally as well, the Palestinian context carries two contradictory discourses. The first is the civil society, feminist and formal, 
uh, one which uh, focuses on women's rights to safety, a life free of violence, clear and gender sensitive laws, due process and fair trial. So the target is reforming the law. Without linking this process of reforming the law into the judicial system as a whole, which is in geopardy, as I tried to say at the beginning. Yet, local societal power holders, <clears throat> supported by the formal patriarchal system, and frequently with the cooperation of civil society organizations, are uh, failing to be consistently attentive to women's needs, particularly when they are in danger. They are all hide behind official bureaucracies of the police, the prosecutors, or the tribal system to refrain from proposing new al alternatives for women uh, subjected to violence. The absence of security signifies the collapse of the public social uh, and moral orders, absence of rule of law, and lack of protection for the weak. Within this context, both women and men must uh, struggle to find the livelihoods that, can, livelihoods that can sustain their families and communities. Uh, the lack of security informs livelihoods men and women choose how they relate to each other and how families and communities regulate the movement of women conditioned by changing norms of gender roles. Any attempt to understand and address violence against women in the occupied Palestinian territories must therefore be addressed within the framework of violence perpetrated and sustained by the ongoing military occupation. The structural and systemic, uh, system, uh, systematic violence of the occupation is not only the most dominant and uh, prevalent form of violence to which women are exposed, it also exploits and reinforces patriarchal norms informing the dominant culture of gender relations in Palestinian society and works, works to create and exacerbate other forms of violence within in Palestinian society, including violence directed against women in both the public and private uh, sphere. Um, according to Women's Center for Legal Aid Council, uh, they put some statistics, uh, you know, um, uh, related to the um, uh, violence perpetrated against uh, uh, women in which the focus was on uh, the honor killing. And I will come back to the depiction of honor killing as the, the most horrible form of violence against women and how it was uh, co-opted and uh, used and misused by um, uh, the colonial uh, power and also uh, the global governance. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, when we come to the, uh, uh, you know, to understand the prevalence uh, of the uh, domestic violence in the Palestinian society, we see that despite the prevalence of, uh, of violence experienced by men, women, and children under the military occupation, the first national survey on domestic violence suggests that overall rates of domestic uh, violence are similar to averages to world, uh, worldwide. According to the study, undertaken by the Palestinian uh, Center, uh, B, uh, Palestinian um, uh, Statistics B, uh, Office, about 30% of married women and 39% of unmarried women suffered domestic uh, violence. That was the first uh, survey. In the last decade, the first national, uh, national survey on domestic violence offers us some benchmarks uh, for assessing the frequency and severity of some form, forms of domestic violence in contemporary family life. An often repeated statistic from this survey is that about a quarter of married Palestinians reporting at least one act of physical violence in 2005, and one in 10 uh, uh, one uh, act of sexual abuse, of which the most common was the husband refusing contraception despite the wife's request. As <clears throat> it is important to further analyze, you know, uh, this data and uh, how it is used or misused, uh, 
you know, by uh, different forms of, uh, uh, of reaction. The survey also uh, uh, showed in a clear way that uh, the practice of domestic uh, violence is very uh, differentiated between regions and between class and between uh, age. Um, according to the PCBS, the uh, Palestinian Statistics uh, Bureau study, women living in large households are most likely to suffer from physical abuse and conflict, reflecting the high level of tension brought on by the economic crisis. Key factors protecting women from physical harm appear to be secondary or higher level of education, gainful employment, and old age. Notably, arguments were found to be uh, the most common type of domestic uh, conflict. Of 47 of married women surveyed reported experiencing this type of, of conflict. According to the, uh, uh, the World Bank uh, study, the collapse of the labor market caused by restrictions of movement and access is not only incurring a collapse in the economy, but also generating covert and uh, overt forms of violence. Men and women have to cope under conditions of tremendous anxiety and, and uncertainty. To ensure family survival, the predominant military force and absence of justice have disempowered men and, and, and family um, and, and forced them to retreat and seek solace in isolation. Married women are making an effort to supplement the family income, but at, at great costs. The pressure they are enduring are not sustainable, though trappings of gender role uh, reveals are discernible. Um, uh, the circumstances which generate such change and the change itself is perceived as humiliating and empowering for both men uh, or women. This is to refer uh, to how women uh, sometimes the women victim of violence are complicit in supporting their, the, the abuse of their husbands. And this is related to the kind of humiliation on checkpoints as I, uh, I showed the picture and the systematic policy of beating male breadwinners in front of the members of their families. So with the, when the, the, the man comes to uh, practice violence against his wife or uh, male, uh, female members, most of the time, you know, they uh, consolidate themselves by uh, saying that he needs to vent it out. This anger inside himself, he needs to vent it out and malish. Uh, it's in his family. Uh, if we are not uh, patient enough with him, who is going to be patient uh, with? Uh, Which is <laughs> running out of time, but it's okay. Okay, so I will. Uh, I cannot read it because I think I put it on my computer and it was not printed. That the second part of my paper is dealing with two things. One is um, uh, the Security Council Resolution 1325, in which you know women's movement uh, globally uh, worked so hard to uh, to have it in hand. Uh, and this is particularly to save or to protect women in conflict zones and, uh, and war uh, areas. How this resolution was translated into the Palestinian context. I, I, I put in details, you know, the circumstances of a warlike situation on daily basis for women. So this resolution could fit perfectly hmm, to mobilize 
uh, women and, and different, uh, the Palestinian Authority and women's movement, they could use it as a tool for um, uh, pressuring international community uh, to activate a sort of uh, protection for Palestinian civilians and Palestinian uh, women. But because of the role of the global governance and the global funding that the Palestinian Authority is relying to, and most of civil society organizations are also relying uh, to, the 1325 resolution in the Palestinian context was uh, limited to uh, the call for uh, protecting Palestinian women from domestic violence. At the total ignorance, you know, of the uh, situation of warlike and the national or the political or the colonial uh, violence. So the resolution generated an industry of projects, you know, using the 1325 to combat domestic uh, violence. And changing the vision and, and uh, objectives of the Palestinian uh, movement, historically speaking, from uh, fighting to ensure self-determination and um, uh, self-determination or auto-determination and national independence into fighting traditions and culture oppressing women, you know, and uh, not doing enough to save women from the violence of uh, their male members in the society. This, you know, uh, was also reflected in two um, article, two reports, one by Human Rights Watch immediately after the publication of the first Palestinian survey on domestic violence. The New York Times uh, put as a, a headline, who, is, uh, who can save Palestinian women from their men? So the use of the language of saving Palestinian uh, women uh, glossed over, you know, the very brutal and long duration of uh, colonial uh, violence perpetrate, uh, perpetrated on Palestinian families, men and me, uh, men, women and uh, and children. So the 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 um, the uh, human rights watch report, uh, of course, focused on the uh, percentage of the, um, uh, the, the percentage of the 23% of uh, Palestinian women are victims of uh, political uh, violence. Um, this is to say that uh, the, the, the politics of fighting domestic uh, violence is very much used by, uh, you know, by the global uh, organizations and by the Israeli uh, forces themselves to stigmatize and to criminalize a society that is always generating uh, violent people and always producing violence against the Israeli uh, occupation. So they linked the two things together that, you know, uh, that the, the, the essence of the culture and the essence of the social relations is uh, very much uh, Im embedded in violent uh, practice uh, against, you know, the weak members in, in the society. So um, this is to say that uh, combating, you know, or fighting uh, domestic violence in the Palestinian uh, um, territories is in a way um, helping, and intentionally of course, helping the continuation of the uh, uh, oppressive structures um, governed by the uh, Israeli colonial uh, power and also by the global uh, governance because they deal with the consequences of violence and they never deal with the, 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 the main structures producing and perpetuating, you know, uh, this violence within the Palestinian society 
and within the Palestinian uh, family. This is to say that this made the, 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 the strategy to combat violence whether by, by Palestinian women uh, movement, women's movement, or by the society, is very complicated. It is very complicated in the sense that uh, dealing with the, 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 you know, dealing with uh, uh, the violence against women per se is, in a way, uh, perpetuating the practice of violence in all the Palestinian contexts that is this violence that is linked, there is a link between the, the colonial uh, violence of the Israelis with the deteriorating conditions, living conditions uh, in the Palestinian society, and of course reflecting itself uh, in the uh, daily lived realities in Palestinian households. This is to say that it is impossible to fight domestic violence in the Palestinian context without really fighting you know, colonial violence uh, as it is exercised by the Israeli uh, occupation uh, power. And in order to do that, uh, a major shift in, in objectives and goals of the Palestinian uh, civil society organizations and the Palestinian Authority itself, a major shift should, hap should happen to shift this vision from combating domestic violence into combating, you know, uh, Israeli uh, occupation uh, policies and asking at the same time for the liberation of the Palestinian as uh, a people and as a nation. Thank you. Uh, I have just a couple of points about uh, the issues of translating, for example, the UN uh, as an international human rights instrument into local justice for Palestine. In other words, how well is it disseminated and vernacularized to a large swath of Palestinian women to realize that actually they have access to this instrument? Um, other things which really uh, sort of disturbed and distressed me, the issue of uh, women's complicity in their own abuse. Are these just the abused woman alone or everybody in the family, everybody in the society who uh, recognizes that domestic violence is taking place, you have entire communities are complicit by witnessing and by be, remaining silent. So uh, in terms of priorities, we know that in colonial studies and post-colonial studies, people say, OK, we have to get our independence first before we turn to the question of women. Until when are we going to be lowest in the food chain? Why isn't it a priority to talk about that, OK, we, women has to do something, society has to do something about domestic issues, liberation, emancipation or not, regardless? I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I want to see how, how is that going to be pumped up to the list of as a top priority when Allah uh, and Bernisi talks about doing daily battle. So the last thing you want is to be beaten. Thank you. So basically, I mean, listening to your, um, your analysis of uh, the issue of violence at the public level in Palestine, you talked about environment, in, I mean, environment or issues at the environment level in terms of global governance and colonial powers, or I mean, uh, Israeli occupation. You talked about state level issues in terms of the government itself and the disunity of the Palestinian uh, government. And he talked about the issues at the public level. But I think that he didn't give much attention to the intermediary level of the state, meaning NGOs. And NGOs, and that's what I mean by that is, you talked about the, 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 the need to shift their strategy f instead of focusing on domestic violence, combating uh, Israeli occupation policies, but you didn't talk about the dysfunction, the dysfunctional nature of NGOs in Palestine. I mean, starting from 1990s, and I think you worked on that uh, in your writings, 
starting from 1990, there has been a change in the modus vivendi of NGOs in, in Palestine. They became smaller in size, uh, urban-based, elitist, uh, and even their messaging changed. This makes them dysfunctional. Given that they, are, are, they represent the intermediary level of the state, meaning that they are the medium that should allow for communication between the state and the public, this dysfunction, uh, this dysfunctional nature of the intermediary level in, in Palestine makes such com I mean such combating of violence impossible. So, these are my okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for such an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, I am a little intrigued on uh, you know what is the way forward. You know we understand there's a lot of problems uh, that are there, in, perhaps in many societies, uh, but what is the way forward towards gender sensitizing uh, the public at large. You know, we are interested both in uh, sensitizing both the men and the women. And uh, we know that, you know, a lot of uh, problems are there in surveys and reports. And uh, we also know that, uh, you know, resolutions and documents uh, really do not take care of what is happening within the four walls of a home. Uh, so, what is a way forward? Uh, okay. That is what I would like to know. Thank you so much. Go ahead, we'll take okay. a seat. Okay, thank you so much for the very nice questions. Uh, 1325 uh, is disseminated through the Norwegian support. I mean, uh, Norwegian showed a great interest from the very beginning in disseminating and uh, rooting the decision in the Palestinian uh, context. So they, they were the, the first one to organize many workshops to explain about 1325 and how it should be translated into the Palestinian, the Palestinian context. And I remember I was a member of this, you know, debate and I almost fought with all my colleagues about, you know, uh, how the shift is is uh, is uh, is happening, and I was always um, rebuffed by saying, uh, occupation is not a hanger that we should put all our problems on it, and uh, and we we should admit that we have, you know, uh, culture and and traditions that. Uh, doesn't prevent, you know, they don't prevent, you know, the practice of violence against women. Anyhow, this is to say that uh, after so many years and after uh, banging our heads against the wall and with uh, so many projects to combat violence, violence, domestic violence is rising. It's not, you know, uh, diminishing. So this means that we, as I said in the presentation, we need to look at the root causes, you know, for the, the, the violence. And as I said, uh, women, they are very much understanding you know, when they are beaten by their husbands or their male members, ah, oh, because they ha he has no work, uh, because, you know, when he went to work today, he was beaten up on the checkpoint, or because he, ju he was just released from prison and he needs, you know, to vent it out. So there is always these excuses, you know, for them. I anyhow, now, 1325, there is like a national committee uh, of, for 1325 that after many problems, they finally put that national violence is equally important. But when it comes to the translation of this vision, the focus is again on domestic violence. You know, I mean, just to you know, to say that we have it here, but the, the money and the funding and the efforts and the activism all go, you know, uh, for the uh, fighting the domestic uh, violence. For the priorities, uh, of course, this is a, a classic question that uh, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a priority. What I'm saying that it should not be separated from the national struggle 
to combat you know all forms of uh, economic political uh, uh, yeah you know because when I showed this uh, uh, picture, you know, uh, and we come to talk to women about, uh, you know, uh, domestic violence, and uh, when their homes are demolished, you know, what does it mean a home is demolished? That the, the women, they cannot go to a toilet, for example. They don't have their kitchen, you know. They don't have beds to sleep on. And you come to talk to her about domestic violence, you know, it doesn't make any sense in this respect. So the, the, the issue is not to put priorities and who, what is, you know, more important than the other, but the, the issue is that it should be linked organically and they should not be separated, you know, and uh, uh, directing all your efforts and energy and activism uh, uh, to uh, deal with the outcomes and not with the deep, uh, uh, you know, roots of the, uh, of the problem in, in our context. So the issue is that when uh, Palestinian uh, women's movement linked to the national movement, uh, was active in combating, you know, uh, colonial violence. They were collectively empowered to confront any practice of domestic violence. It, w it was a scandal for a militant or a freedom fighter to be known as an, you know, uh, an abuser or uh, the, as someone uh, beating his wife or his daughter, it, it, it was a, a scandal for this person. So this was done by women, uh, women groups in general, and also the, the, their success in creating a collective culture that is condemning, you know, this practice within the Palestinian uh, household. Now it is no longer the case. Now it is no longer the case in the sense that as uh, Islam, you know, uh, put it, with the enjoyization of the women's movement and uh, the transformation of the movement into uh, women, women's shops, you know, funded uh, uh, to, uh, to combat violence. This, you know, uh, peer pressure and this uh, national, you know, taking a national face, uh, condemning this practice is no longer uh, here. Instead, we have, uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, media campaigns, lo lots of uh, uh, brochures uh, combating domestic violence for unknown audience not for particular, it's for unknown audience, it's for, for everyone, for all the society. So the, again, the, the issue is not, you know, to prioritize, but the issue is to link it, you know, in a very organic uh, way. Jamila Bouhreed and others who participated on equal footing were basically sent back to the kitchen. So liberation as a condition itself, I think necessary but not sufficient to convey the lesson that if you are beaten by an Israeli police, it shouldn't make you feel better to come back and beat your wife or, or uh, daughter. Uh, and by espousing the same kind of violence, I just worry about uh, what, uh, you know, is emerging as perpetual violence in war and peace. That is yeah. just my... Okay. No, uh, first of all, I have to admit that uh, I disagree with what is known as the Algerian syndrome. Uh, the Algerian syndrome was never true, in my opinion. And the proof is that uh, the women's movement in Algeria is always uh, you know, um, using, I will say, it is always using the national figures, you know, to achieve certain internal gains for women, till now, till now. So what does it mean? It means that these women, the freedom fighters women, you know, they 
this, they were and still are national icons. They gained a status and power that is not there for other ordinary women, you know. Uh, so they were not sent back to the kitchen silently. They are not. And till now, they are, they are still public figures. This... No, when it, okay, when it comes to the Palestinian uh, women's movement, uh, the Palestinian women's movement were very much empowered when it comes to issues related to gender equality by their national uh, role. You know, I mean, those who participated in the national struggle were not ordinary women in the face of other, you know, uh, the, the public in, in general. They were, uh, they were looked at as national icons and very well respected exactly as men. And these women, because of this national role they played, they were the spearhead in, in putting all the, the, the needs and all the interests, gender, in, gender equality interests, uh, in the face of uh, the Palestinian uh, Authority. But when I compare this generation to the generation of NGOs leaders, they don't have any comparable uh, power to these women. First of all, they did not manage to produce any new leadership on the national scale as the national uh, movement, as the in involvement of uh, women in the national uh, mo movement struggle in general. So many leaders were produced uh, all along and now we, since 1993, the Oslo Agreement, till now, when I look back to see how many, you know, women leaders coming from NGO socialization are known as a national figure, none, none, you know. What does it mean? It means that women were empowered collectively to fight for their national liberation and in the same time to ask for gender emancipation. In the same time, be, they were not prioritizing or they were not, you know, ignoring certain uh, uh, aspects in, in favor of other uh, aspects. While NGOs leaders, they have nothing to do with national struggle. You know, it's not there. The only issue is how to apply CEDO on the Palestinian condition and all the universal conventions for women's rights that we have to follow and write reports to ESCOA and the UN uh, women about the progress uh, achieved on women's lives, you know, uh, under occupation. So suddenly you can achieve progress and development under occupation. It's all, you know, uh, uh, imagination. It's all imagination. You know, the international, the international conventions created a case of, you know, total Im imaginary situation for, for women and, and the people, you know. Uh, for uh, uh, Islam, have yes. Go, we're going to have to go faster. Okay. I will combine this with the last uh, question. Uh, in how to, uh, how to, uh, what is the way uh, forward? What is the way forward? It's not through the, uh, the in, not through the injuization of the agenda of combating violence. As why, as I explained before, but you know, if I go back to the achievements. Um, uh, that took place when women's movement was active uh, at, on both fronts, the national and social uh, front. Now, uh, I think, you know, uh, new research showed that um, community, and especially women in different communities, uh, disagree and they reject, they refuse the practice uh, any practice of violence against women, especially the honor killing. And this means that through the, the working with the communities, it's themselves, 
we can achieve a lot than targeting, uh, you know, uh, unknown and invisible audience uh, through advocacy and sensitization as practiced now by in, uh, NGOs. So uh, working with the community will empower women collectively and it will create, especially in, you know, the areas where uh, lots of uh, colonial violence is taking place, as I said, in, 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 not in villages, for example, it's more mostly in urban, poor urban centers and, and areas targeted by an excessive Israeli uh, violence for land confiscation like in Jerusalem or in, in Hebron. So working with the communities, in empowering the community, is very important, it, which it means that it should be combated not on the cultural level, but at all levels, economic, you know, uh, uh, social, uh, legal, uh, uh, national. It should be dealt with in a comprehensive uh, manner and not only, you know, targeting the consciousness of men and women that they should refuse uh, domestic violence. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have a very small question, and thank you, by the way, this was absolutely wonderful. We could sit for one more hour and, and discuss what you have to say. A very small question. Uh, is colonial violence recognized as gender violence? Is there a statement that includes colonial violence Exactly that. Is it recognized? You know, just like uh, domestic violence is recognized as as, um, as gender violence, is colonial violence recognized as such? By who? By all the organizations say, that we have been talking about. They, all the international conventions. Not by in, not by international organizations. You know, it's really funny because I uh, I was in a meeting with a new head of the women UN Women, uh, you know, office in Ramallah. It's the headquarters for all the West Bank, and it was so funny to hear myself empowering them to speak up. So it's that not. you are UN agents here, and you witness, you see, you hear, you know, you pass through checkpoints, speak about it. It's actually the Israeli situation that's stopping this kind of uh, de declaration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we can see colonial violence all over the world, I mean, all over Africa, because of this, and it, it, can, it can really cover a lot. Yeah, you know? of course. But yeah. we don't, uh, so we don't have a declaration like that, and... Uh, you think it could be because of the Israeli situation that nobody wants to touch this? It's, it, there is lots of distortion about, you know, how to, to see or how to depict uh, colonial violence. As I said, that this discourse of, you know, women's rights, global women's rights is really uh, damaging and, and undermining, you know, the, 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 tar the targeting of, of colonial uh, violence from our side. And of course, the international donors, uh, they are afraid to speak up because if they put it in their reports, they are afraid that they will not be able to Base function funds, yeah. in, in the occupied Palestinian so Actually, moving forward, maybe that's one of the things we can do, and that is we begin talking about colonial violence and actually theorizing it as a separate type of violence under which a lot comes. Because in my readings, I haven't seen you know, the, the talk about the violence perpetrated against women because of colonization. We don't really have a statement regarding what uh, colonial violence is. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this, Luciana. We'll move on to the GCC now. First of all, good morning, and thank you, Rogaya, for, for inviting me to, to, to share what I am doing uh, on the other side of the, of the city. Uh, Actually, yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my, uh, what I'm going to present here is uh, a comparison between the um, uh, different countries in the in, in the Gulf region, since we are in the in, in the region. Uh, and my idea was to trying to compare Iran and the GCC states, not because I want to make the point that one country is better than the other, uh, but because of the nature of uh, all these states is more or less similar, I will compare this uh, at, at the end of the, of the, of the, the at the end of my, my presentation. So first I will compare 
the constitutional frameworks regarding women in executive or legislative positions and political rights granted to, to women? I mean, what is a legal framework that every country um, uh, established uh, uh, regarding women's political rights and uh, the options to uh, reach office? Then uh, I will compare the elective and appointed positions held by women in the GCC states uh, and Iran. Uh, and finally, I will try to discuss and uh, di discuss, and maybe you, you will help me with this, uh, the causes of the failure in, polit in female political empowerment of these states. Uh, first of all, I have to say that the nature of all these states, I will, I will refer to this at the end, uh, all these uh, uh, countries, in, in mainly in the region, are, they have an authoritarian nature from the political science perspective, and my approach to uh, gender inequalities in uh, women participating in decision-making processes through this uh, lens, through the political science, uh, comparative politics, by comparing how the um, uh, uh, structures of the political systems are, were established and which are the um, legal frameworks that prevent women to have a better situation or to improve their participation in decision-making process. So, first of all, uh, the constitutional frameworks combine all these states. I, I'm including Iraq here, uh, even though I'm not going to discuss Iraq in the whole uh, presentation, uh, due to the fact that in 2005 Iraq suffered from um, uh, new, um, I mean, after the, 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 the invasion of uh, Iraq and after the war, there was a new uh, constitutional framework that organized all the political structures again. And for the first time, uh, women issues or gender equalities were introduced in the, in the Constitution as part of the, of the framework, even though then we can discuss whether it was uh, implemented or not. But from the legal point of view in the Constitution of Iraq is mentioned for the first time and since the preamble very explicitly that the, all Iraqis uh, should pay attention to women's and their rights and in the Article 20 of the Constitution that Iraqi citizens, men and women, shall have the right to participate in public affairs and to enjoy political rights, including the right to vote, elect, and run for office. So, comparing all these constitutions in, in the region, the Iraqi one, after the, um, the, the fall of the Saddam uh, uh, Hussein regime, for the first time is explicitly including the right of women to vote uh, and to run for office regardless which stage of the political structure we refer about. So in that sense, the Iraqi constitution of 2005 is the most advanced, followed by the Iranian constitution of 1979, reform in 1989, regardless then of how this is implemented in, the, in, in practice. Um, the Iraqi constitution also mentioned the right of uh, women to actively participate in political career, by running for elective position, as stated in the chapter one, uh, in, when we discuss the legislative power and the council of uh, representatives, uh, by establishing also um, a quota, a positive discrimination mechanism that is implemented for the first time in, in the region, uh, in order to guarantee the 25% female uh, representation in the elective chamber. So, specifically, the article says the elections law shall aim to achieve the percentage of representation of four women of none less than one quarter of the members of the Council of Representatives. So, this new constitution implemented in 2005 uh, for the first time is implementing a quota system, which is also implemented in other developed and non-developed countries. Uh, we, I will compare later uh, Spain, Argentina, how this quota uh, system uh, contributed to increase the participation of women in, in politics, or at least in, at uh, parliamentary level. Uh, this is, I, I mentioned this, uh, that Iraq is not part of what I'm trying to, to discuss here, but I'm giving an example of how a country that passed through an, a very authoritarian, uh, through a very authoritarian context after the new developments that took place in 2005, they were able to introduce these elements uh, of uh, gender equality, at least uh, formally, in the, um, in the constitutional framework. 
Uh, the next uh, case is Iran in 70, 1979 constitution after the Islamic revolution uh, recognized its, uh, in its first pages uh, the right of women to participate in politics to, due to their fundamental role in the revolutionary process. Uh, so it's a right that they got according to, to Khomeini and the revolutionary forces because they, they, they gained that uh, right uh, due to part their participation in the, in the revolutionary process. So I'm not going to read uh, the whole uh, article, but it's ex explicitly mentioned in the Constitution that the, the women, uh, women have the right to vote uh, or to participate actively in politics because of what they did during the revolution uh, to overthrow the, the Shah. Uh, 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 moreover, there's also a specific subsection in the Constitution uh, entitled Women in the Constitution that states as a part of this process it is only natural that for women should benefit from a particularly large augmentation of their rights because of the greater oppression that they suffer under the Taguti regime, which is the way in which uh, Pahlavi regime is mentioned. Again, I'm referring to the legal framework without uh, mentioning how this is implemented, uh, has been implemented since then until, until now. Uh, the, if we cross the, 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 the Gulf and we start talking about the GC states, Kuwait is the most uh, experimented country in electoral terms. However, in 1962 constitution, which was reinstated after the occupation in 1992, there is no single mention to women rights or political role every time that people is used as a generic term. While in the Iranian and the Iraqi constitution, women are specifically mentioned as women, uh, as differently from men, uh, in the uh, Kuwaiti constitution is uh, referring to people. At least this is uh, the official translation uh, into uh, in Bahrain, the social and political rights are clearly guaranteed by the state in the Article 5, uh, as uh, it is mentioned in the in, in, in section of the article I, I, I cite. The state guarantees reconciling the duties of women toward the family with their work in society and their equality uh, with men in political, social, cultural, and economic spheres without breaking the, provi the provision of the Islamic canon law. Moreover, the Bahraini constitution is the only one from the, the cases analyzed in the GCC context in which women's right to vote and run for election is specifically mentioned in the constitution, in the article uh, one, uh, by stating citizens, both men and women, are entitled to participate in public affairs and may enjoy political rights, including the right to vote and to stand for the elections, in accordance with this constitution and the condition of principle. So in the Bahraini case, again, it is mentioned, it is specify men and both men and women and specifying that uh, women have the right to uh, both vote and uh, run for elections. The Omani constitution in 1996 amended in 2011 uh, uh, is not specifically mentioned women and uh, is using the generic term of citizens to refer social and political rights. Uh, and there is no uh, mention uh, to specific right of women to run for an elected post in the Shura Council even though this is then uh, implemented through the electoral law that is uh, stated uh, later, later on, I think, into South, um, well, I don't remember exactly the, the, the electoral law of uh, Oman, which was the last one. But it, it's not stated in the Constitution. Uh, neither it is mentioned in the, um, the Saudi Basic Law of 1992, amended in, in 2005, in which they use citizens every time they refer to Saudi uh, men and women. The same as it happened with the Emirati Constitution in 1971, amending in 2004, and the Qatari Constitution in 2003, uh, Constitution of 2003, where people and citizens are used as generic terms when referring to social and political uh, rights. Um, I'm not quite familiar with the, the discussions at the linguistic level, but I assume that this have a meaning when you are not specifically mentioned both uh, men and women when you have other constitution in the world that they specifically mention uh, both men and women in order to clarify that we are referring to something that represents uh, uh, gender equality. Then, I mean, this is a legal framework, how this is implemented uh, at the um, political level, at the institutional level. 
uh, if we refer to head of state uh, and government uh, currently existing in the world, we have uh, 31, and they are distributed in the way that uh, it is in the table, uh, 15 in Europe, uh, 6 in Latin America and Caribbean, 3 in Africa and Asia and Oce uh, 7 in Asia and Oceania altogether. Uh, currently, there is only one, I mean, this is just to contextualize how many women in, the, in this part of the world we can find at, at the um, highest, highest uh, position in the executive power. Uh, only Sheikha Hasina Wajid in Bangladesh has been the prime minister since 2009 until now, if I'm not wrong. And in Muslim or, yeah, Muslim context, we can say that only Benazir Bhutto and Tansu Chiller were the two only prime ministers that they, they held uh, that office uh, until until now. So far, there is no other head of state or head of government that has been woman in the in the Muslim and Arab uh, context. And this can also provide you uh, or provide us um, a, an element to analyze at the end. I mean, why? Uh, I mean, if this is the nature of the regimes or the political regimes that they are implemented in this region that prevent women to have positions at the executive level. Uh, governmental participation in the world, we can see that the darkest um, uh, areas of the, of the world are those who have less women representation uh, in the, um, at the ministerial level. Uh, so we started with the head of states and head of government, we continue with the level which is also at the executive branch of uh, power and we see that the whole region, mainly Africa and Asia, is darker than other areas like uh, Europe uh, or Latin America, I would say, with the exception of uh, Brazil. If uh, we refer specifically to the region, we have to say that the only country that uh, supposedly allows uh, women to run for uh, executive uh, position or the highest executive position, well, not the highest, it's the second one, uh, is uh, Iran, since uh, they implement elections at the presidential level in which women are not uh, specifically denied to participate. There is always a debate every time there, is, there are elections, presidential elections in Iran, whether women can run or not, or whether can they be uh, presidential candidates or not, and there is always uh, a very ambiguous uh, declaration by the Guardian Council declaring that women are not forbidden to run. But however, from the women that they started to apply for presidential uh, candidacy in 1997 until now, none uh, was uh, approved by the Guardian Council. So every time there were women uh, in, the, um, in the Ministry of Interior registry to, uh, to register their candidacy, they were all rejected by the, by the Guardian Council. So even though it's not prohibition for women to run for a presidential position, so far never succeed, uh, no women uh, succeeded in getting it. Even though in the last election in May, um, well, this May, uh, 137 women uh, applied uh, and no one uh, was able to. But this is the only country in this context comparing uh, Iran and DCC, in which there is a position in which women supposedly can run. In the other, uh, in the GCC context, there is no uh, election for executive position, so there is no way women can, can run for, for election. In fact, the nature of the, the government or the systems is um, a monarch, a hereditary monarchy, so it's almost impossible. I mean, it's not impossible, it's almost impossible for women to uh, aspire to get a, a, an ex. The, highest executive position uh, in, in the country. Uh, I mentioned that the Iranian uh, president is the second highest position. The highest position in the executive level is the, uh, the um, spiritual leader, the Belayat de Fakir, and for that position it's, almost in, it's also, well, I wouldn't say it's 100% impossible, but it's almost impossible for a woman to reach that position since um, uh, Fakir I mean, it's uh, the, um, the person who is at the top of the state uh, structure should be a faqih, a faqih which has recognition by all its uh, pairs. And so far, even though there are uh, seminars in Iran that, in which women can uh, 
dedicated to uh, interpret the, the, the Sharia. Uh, so far, they haven't been able to succeed in improving their, their, their positions in the hierarchical um, uh, pyramid in the um, religious level. Possible for a woman to, uh, to reach the position of Belayat um, al even though it, in the constitution it's not, again, it's not, it's not specifically forbidden. Uh, if we refer to ministerial positions, uh, we have the, in this uh, list which was the first time that a woman occupied the ministerial position in all these uh, countries. Uh, Iran is the first one since the 1968. There was the first uh, Ministry of Education during the times of uh, the Shah Reza Pahlavi. And then we need to wait until 1997 for a vice president uh, to be appointed uh, by Mohammad Hatami. But even though this position is not, a, even though it's this mentioned as Minister, Minister of Environmental Protection, is not a minister per se, because it's not a position that required a minister, um, parliamentary approval, which is the case of 2009 when, when, uh, when for the first time officially a woman uh, got the position of minister. Uh, paradoxically uh, proposed by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and it was accepted by the, by the parliament. After that, no other woman in Iran uh, occupied the position. So before or after that, no other woman occupied the position of minister under uh, the Islamic Republican system. We have to wait until 2003 to, to see the first minister of education in the GCC context, Sheikh Ahmad uh, Al Mahmoud um, in 2003, then Bahrain in 2004, Oman and UAE in the same year. For the first time, they were appointed Minister of Health, Social Development, Economic Planning. Uh, Kuwait in 2005, even though we mentioned before that it was, they were the most advanced in electoral terms, it took uh, a while for women to uh, access to the um, ministerial level uh, positions. And so far in Saudi Arabia, unless I have wrong information, no woman was uh, never occupied the position of minister, only deputy minister of education in 2009. Uh, historically speaking, we have on the last row, on the last column, all the women that, the, that occupied ministerial uh, positions in all the countries. So Saudi Arabia so far is, is uh, zero. Currently, uh, women in ministerial positions, we have uh, one in Iran, which is vice president, which is not a minister, it has a, a range of ministers, but it's not approved by the, by, the, by the parliament, so it's appointed directly by the president. And in the rest of the countries, we have one uh, currently in Qatar, one in Bahrain, two in Oman, one in Kuwait, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, ministries uh, in, um, in uh, the UAE, which is the biggest number in the whole region. Uh, some of them is not clear which are the yes. Minister of Happiness, of course. I, I'm not quite sure what uh, some of them are they doing, because there are three Ministers of State that they don't have, uh, at least in the website of the Cabinet, it's not specifically mentioned which is the portfolio that they, they manage. But of course the most Curious one is the Ministry of Happiness and, 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 and Wellbeing. But um, actually, yesterday or two days ago, there was an article published in the National specifying that uh, um, Emirates has more female in the ministries than the United States. Like a, uh, more like a spectacle than. If we refer to women in, in Parliament, I will try to, to rush to, to, to reach to the end. Uh, the percentage of women worldwide is 23.6, uh, comparing all the parliaments in the, in the world. And again, if we reach our region, it's not the discriminated by the specifically the countries we are referring to, but Arab states is mm, almost the last uh, group in comparing all the, all the, all the countries. Uh, comparing the members of uh, uh, the lower house and the upper uh, house uh, in the in the whole world, so 18 or well 17.5 all combined. We have to bear in mind that some of the um, houses are appointed and other houses are uh, elected. 
if we compare the, the region, uh, and here I try to make a comparison between uh, countries uh, that they belong to the region and some other countries that they don't belong, uh, but I know because of, I mean, I know the, the realities because, of, well, first I am Argentinian and second I lived in, in Spain for a long time. And I wanted also to compare with Japan, which is a country that, um, I mean, Spain, Argentina and Iraq, they passed through authoritarian uh, experiences Franco regime, the military juntas in Argentina, the Saddam Hussein regime, and the three of them implemented quota systems, uh, which is, I think, an interesting element to bear in mind in order to uh, empower uh, women participation in decision-making processes. Uh, while Iraq quota is 25%, uh, the Spanish one is 40 and the Argentinian is 30, and you can see that the amount of, uh, or the, the percentage is um, sometimes uh, overpassing this uh, quota system that uh, by, by, by law. So in the Argentinian case at least is much uh, higher than the quota. So it's something that is not uh, something that, okay, we reach 30% because we need to do that, but it's even, it's even more. And in fact, we had the uh, Argentinian president until last, last year which uh, shows that in Latin American context uh, by um, using this group their, their um, the, I mean, it's, I think it's the three cases, Spain, Argentina, and Iraq is uh, a matter of um, changing the political system that existed before, passing through an authoritarian regime, uh, obtaining or gaining um, uh, gender equalities and a, a component of getting uh, justice or a more uh, equal uh, political system that allows or uh, allows the representation or fair representation of all the citizens, including both men and, and women. Uh, then the rest of the countries, we will see that, uh, I mean, the percentage is very low. This is uh, an in international ranking in which uh, countries like uh, Kuwait, uh, Oman, Qatar are still uh, very low. and at, at legislative level, uh, we don't even have in Saudi Arabia or, um, or, or Qatar proper uh, legislative uh, councils. Uh, finally, very briefly, this is also to show you how women are uh, um, participating in the electoral and uh, legislative elections in Iran with a lot of women uh, as candidates, uh, around 10%, the highest amount of uh, the highest proportion of women applying for candidates in, in legislative elections, but only few uh, made it to the, um, the chamber. Being now in the last uh, elections, 1916, uh, the, uh, the biggest amount of women in the, in the current parliament in Iran, uh, 17. Uh, we can make the same comparisons in, in, in Kuwait where women, they did not succeed in getting uh, uh, seats uh, or not, not, did not succeed to get a lot of seats in, uh, in the Kuwaiti National Assembly, the maximum uh, being four in 2009, even though still there are a lot of women that they, they run for, for, for seats, uh, legislative seats in all the elections since 2008, which was the first time they were allowed to, to participate. Uh, Bahrain, the House of Representatives, is more or less the same, even though there are, um, uh, don't have exactly the amount of candidates that they run for elections, but very few uh, made it, and in the last election, 2014, only three were able to do it. In those cases in which there is an upper house, like in, in Bahrain or in Oman, the governments, they are trying to compensate the lack of uh, women in the legislative or the representative uh, councils by appointing women and the, in the upper house. So this is the case of um, uh, Bahrain, in which they appointed, for instance, eight uh, women or 11, 10, it depends on the, the, the term, to compensate the lack of women in the number. So it could be another way of positive discrimination by appointing women instead of um, granting them or um, empowering them to get better uh, results in electoral processes. Finally, uh, Oman, the same, only one, uh, two, I mean, 
an average of one woman made it to the, um, the Sura Council since 2003 until, until now. Uh, I'm not going, I think I overpassed my time, so I will not uh, mention this. Uh, in Bahrain and um, in the UAE, uh, it's a curious case in which so far we haven't, we haven't um, uh, universal vote, only, I think the last election, only 40% of the eligible voters were able to, to vote, so it's impossible to talk about um, um, women participating in politics uh, since not even men are able to participate in politics uh, altogether. Uh, only a selected group of voters were able to vote in 2006, 2011, and 2015. Uh, and uh, in Qatar and, and in Saudi, we don't have legislative elections, only uh, municipal uh, elections that uh, we had in, in Qatar since 1999. Uh, women ran as a candidates, not in a very uh, big uh, proportion, only a maximum of six uh, women. And so far, only two women were able to access to the Central Municipal Council um, through elections. Basically, what I'm trying to, to, to discuss here is none of the seven countries, the six GCC states and, and Iran, were able to uh, succeed in achieving uh, female empowerment objectives declared by their governments, even though they are mentioned in the Constitution, even though they are included in the visions, national vision, etc., etc. Uh, mainly, uh, we have to um, bear in mind that the nature of the political regimes could be the main reason behind this uh, uh, failure. As I mentioned before, the character of the, the states uh, with the um, monarchies, with the uh, or um, leadership in the country that they can be only occupied by, by male, prevents any way of uh, women participating in executive uh, positions, and also the patriarchal, religious, and character, uh, retrieval character of the societies as well, that is an element that sometimes prevents women to succeed in electoral terms. Uh, I mean, this is part of a much bigger um, research on how are the voter, uh, voting patterns in all these uh, countries, but it's very difficult for a woman, for instance, to succeed in a tribal context in which you are running against the head of a tribe in Kuwait, for instance, uh, or in other, in other, in other places, or when people in the GCC context, or even in Iran, are voting, uh, having in mind the family uh, links, family relations, and this is represented by someone male that can attract much more votes than uh, a woman. Uh, women fail to maintain a meaningful presence in the parliaments, less than 6% combined in all the seven countries. Uh, and one question that we should, could ask uh, ourselves is why women do not vote for women? Having in my, I, I don't have the data here, I have it in, in the paper. Uh, proportionally, women are much um, than men in electoral terms. In most of the countries, uh, women are voting more than men. However, women are not succeeding in getting votes from their, uh, their um, gender fellows. I don't know if this is an expression. Uh, How come we have uh, Trump as president? Sorry? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, of course, it's something that can be applicable to, to, to a lot of countries as well. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that this is specifically happening, happening here. Uh, here, what we have uh, different is, the, I mean, the character of the society or the nature of the society and the character of the, the political regimes that, um, by law, including, uh, uh, or by constitution, is not... Um, given the chance for women to even think about running for some position or, or applying for, for some position. More or less this is what I wanted to, to discuss. It's uh, mind-boggling from what you showed us. Why is it that it's in the Arab world that you don't get um, women as leaders? As we see it in Turkey, it happened at least once. We see it yeah, or, or the whole subcontinent, uh, but also in Pakistan, it's normative. Uh, but um, but the, even in Iran, you know, they tried at least to put into the constitution some sort of an understanding 
of women having some rights. Why is it that uh, the Arab world, is this what we're talking about? Is it something to do with, I don't know if you've done work on this, but as you presented this, it became very clear that uh, from then it's about tribalism, question we really Thank, thank you, Luciana, for your presentation. Um, it's a question and a rather uh, comment, you know, especially I'm reacting to the statistics on Iraqi women. Uh, so the question is to what extent we can really uh, evaluate the status of women as it is represented in the constitution and uh, how numbers could be accurate in reflecting the lived realities of Iraqi women. The reason I'm asking this is to my mind, and of course, you know, you correct me if I am wrong, is that yes, in the constitution now there's 25% of parliament seats should be uh, for women, but if I compare the democratic era um, and its um, benefits to women uh, to the dictatorship era under Saddam Hussein, I would say that women under Saddam were much better when it comes to education, work, you know, culture and uh, safety then in the era of the American constitution put by Bremer in which 25% are, are women, while women cannot really, young women cannot really go safely to their schools or workplaces. So what is your intake on that? Thank you. I, I think this, um Figures actually tell very little about what, what's ha really happening on the ground. Um, um, first of all, um, what is the constituency of, of a woman in the patrimonial system? And if the patrimonial system is the, one, the system that is there, what is the role of parliaments, uh, what is the role of uh, governments and all this? Um, and we uh, check in each country what exactly is the, um, what kind of strategy the women's movement has taken in order to increase women's say in politics. And I'm um, a bit skeptical about this uh, quarter issue because um, in different countries the, the quarter in different countries, the, the women's movement has taken different position towards quotas. It's not automatically a good thing. Uh, for instance, in Yemen, the women's movement is divided on this issue. And those who come from the ruling party are in favor of quotas, while those who come from other parties are against it. Uh, meaning that uh, the quota system, according to them, uh, brings forward femocrats. So, and that leads uh, to my third critical point, and which is uh, that um, if we have Margaret Thatcher, um, a strong leader, definitely a woman, um, then we have, um, then the point is that, uh, I mean that the, uh, women's empowerment in politics is a different thing than number of women or femocrats in leading positions. Thank you for, for, for the comments and, and questions. Of course, I mean, I, I am here referring to, to, to numbers uh, to analyze what women do in, when they are in office is something that requires, uh, I think, a lot of uh, more work. Uh, uh, and uh, I would love to, to do that if I have the, the chance to, to continue doing this kind of uh, research. Um, regarding, well, she asked a question, <laughs> I will leave it for, for later. Um, differences within the GCC. Sometimes here things are um, 
a comp like a competitions, for instance. I mean, I would say that in some cases, uh, I mean, uh, as we mentioned before, to have women in positions doesn't mean that they have a gender agenda or that they have a progressive agenda or nothing like that. Uh, or even that the governments are appointing women to some positions doesn't mean that they are very worried about women uh, uh, conditions uh, in other aspects. Uh, and that's why I mentioned that sometimes it's a competition. I mean, we are discussing about women's rights in, in, the, in the region and suddenly Saudi Arabia started to, decided to appoint 30 women in the Shura Council uh, without even having elections for the Shura Council in, in the whole country. So the nature of the state, the character of the state did not change. It's the same uh, appointed Shura Council that has no legislative role at all, but however they have 30 women to say, okay, we have female representation. Does it mean that the gender agenda is included in the Shura Council, I don't. I mean, uh, there are people that they are working on on, on that. Uh, Mark Thompson in, in in Saudi Arabia is working on that. Uh, it might be something that it was not before, but in any case, I don't trust that the the, the agenda of these 30 women in the appointed in the Shura Council would be that much progressive in, in gender and in gender terms. Um, the same when we said that the Bahraini government is appointing women in the Senate to compensate women that they are not elected, elected in the representative council. This doesn't mean that the women, they have a progressive agenda. In fact, all the people that are disappointed uh, by the government are always following the government, governmental agenda. So whether the government is implementing progressive uh, uh, measures regarding women or not, it's up to their, their governments. In the Kuwaiti cases, I think it was uh, interesting that the government was the one pushing for a progressive agenda in, in terms of uh, gender. I mean, the elections were, I mean, the right to vote for women was granted because of the government pressure and against the will of the elected parliament. Uh, and in fact, every time there is a debate about uh, women's uh, right uh, to vote again in, in the, in the, in the the National Assembly in, in Kuwait. So there are differences in, within the nature of the systems. And I think in both Bahrain and Kuwait, uh, the systems have been a little bit more open uh, in terms of political rights and in terms of attributions granted to the elective institutions that they might, make, uh, might produce a change at the political level and also at the gender level. The problem is sometimes these elective institutions are not moving toward what we, from, I have to say, from this side, from the Western perspective, we consider that this is progressive in gender equality. But in, a, in other cases, I think it's purely competition. The fact that Emirates have seven ministers, female ministers now, I'm not quite sure if this is related to women, real women empowerment. I mean, if these women are really performing in a way that is, it represented a um, positive change for women in, in, uh, in Emirates. That's a cosmetic uh, uh, appointment of women in offices uh, as Minister of State to claim that they have more ministers than the United States. Uh, me, uh, by reading the other day this article, I realized that uh, all about. Um, well, I wanted to reply what, what she said, uh, what she asked about, of course, again, we are talking about uh, numbers here and figures or uh, how women are performing in electoral terms or how women are accessing to positions, uh, ministerial level positions or parliamentary level, but this doesn't mean that the situation of women, generally speaking, in the country improve or not. Uh, in Iraq, we have a post-conflict, uh, uh, well, well, post-conflict, I mean, we are still in a conflict, an open conflict in, in Iraq, but the structure of the government, the constitution and the electoral law were uh, done following uh, international advice. And that's why, constitutionally speaking, is the most uh, advanced in terms of granting equal representation for both men and women, supposedly, uh, providing guarantees for the 
people of Iraq to be re equally represented at the regional uh, level. I mean, not to be negatively discriminated because of their belonging to one region or the other. This is in theory. That's why we had later, of course, is a mess in which no political agreement was able to be did uh, in the last elections. Uh, and this, of course, affects the way in which all the, development, the political developments are, are taking place in, in Iraq, including war, including instability or whatever. I don't think that women can make it uh, better than during the times of Saddam, during, uh, having in mind this violent situation in the whole country. But I'm not quite sure that we can blame the Constitution or the way in which the electoral law was designed uh, Failure. I mean, the problem is, I would say, basically, by men that they are fighting and they keep fighting, and they cannot uh, stop um, uh, fighting in the country. Uh, of course, we, uh, women are in this case in Iraq uh, victims of all this messy situation. I don't think that women would be in a better shape now, uh, collectively speaking, in Iraq than than before. If this was promised, she left. I cannot. I can reply directly. Um, well, this is more or less, again, I mean, the strategy of women in parliament, of course. Sometimes we say, okay, now we have 17 women in Iran. Does it mean that these women, the 17 women have a progressive agenda? Uh, unfortunately, most of them, if not all of them, are from the conservative side. So, of course, they have an, uh, their own agenda in gender terms, but from our perspective, it's not the same that having a reformist or having a, or a liberal that is pushing for um, equal uh, rights between women and men. Mm. That's why, for instance, uh, the president in Iran, the reformist president in Iran, would never dare to appoint a reformist woman with a clear progressive agenda as a minister that requires approval from the parliament, because the parliament would reject that. And the only one who made that was uh, Ahmadinejad, because he counted on the support of the conservatives to appoint someone who had no progressive agenda at all. But now, uh, Mola Verdi, uh, Ebtekar, or other very renowned uh, uh, women uh, in Iran that they are fighting for, uh, to some extent, for equality, gender equality in Iran, they are vice presidents or direct advisors of the president. They don't require parliamentary approval because the parliament will never, even women will not vote for them. I reply on the. Microphone. I have some comments and, and a question. So, when you had your slides up there, you put Bahrain in a, a different category. Um, I thought it's actually not that different from the other GCC countries because the preamble in their constitution, well, it does acknowledge that women have a role to play in public life. It qualifies that by, by linking them to the family in a way that it does not link men. So it's, it's still um, leaning very heavily towards women and the home as their natural space. And there are also a lot of qualifiers in that um, preamble as well. So to me, in the end, Bahrain, at least as far as the preambles are concerned, isn't that much different from the other GCC countries. And then the other thing I noticed when you had your slide up there, and I noticed this because in my country, for a very long time, when you had, we only used to have one female minister, and it was always Ministry of Culture and Social <laughs> Services. From the 1980s, you know, education. First, yeah, first education. it would only be assistant minister, it was always just one assistant minister, and then sometime in the 90s we got the first full minister, but it was still Minister of Culture and Social Services. And I come from one of those countries where the government only listens through violence and they have to be forced to do things. Um, and it's only now 
after we got the 2010 constitution that you have women in substantive ministerial positions like Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Environment, which in my country holds a lot of weight because um, tourism is a major foreign exchange earner and you're talking game reserves and so on. So when you're Minister for Environment, that's a very powerful portfolio. But that came with, you know, through a moment of crisis and so on, because we seem to operate on crisis, even now we have another crisis. Okay, then the other comment I have is, um, you know, Susan Dahlgren, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name well, but you had the comment about Margaret Thatcher, which I agree, she was horrible <laughs> for, <laughs> for women, you know to be very careful about how much weight we place on the few women who have ascended to positions of power. Because um, if we say women are equal to men, women are human beings. So they will have their weaknesses just like men. Um, and I think the problem is we've had so few out there. And when you have a few, they carry so much weight and those who don't perform like Margaret Thatcher allows others to point at them and say, well, you see, it doesn't matter who's in charge. But I'd like to give a, a different example. And the example I'd like to give is a woman who ascended to power and actually pointed to Margaret Thatcher as the type of leader she would not want to be. And that is none other than Scotland's uh, first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who said before she got elected that if she got elected, she would run her government in a way that was different from Margaret Thatcher. And one of the first ways she proved it was her cabinet was split down the middle. So it has almost 50-50 men and women, but it's not just in the cabinet but, um, level, but when you look at how she's running her government, the sort of policies that she has put in place, they, they remind us of the sorts of things people used to talk about in the 80s as far as gender mainstreaming is concerned, before, before society got disillusioned and that was also you know, abandoned in the backyard. And then I have one last question. Now, this is where my question comes, but I have to preface this question. It's about quota systems. And I agree with you, quota systems are very controversial. Um, again, in my country, uh, through violence uh, you know, and crisis, and women have also latched onto this form of moving things ahead, it really just seems like the only way anything ever gets done in my country, unfortunately. Um, but they latched onto this and managed in 2010 to put in the Constitution um, uh, a provision that there's no public body in the country that can be represented by more than two thirds of any gender. And they very carefully avoided putting women there. They just said more than two thirds of any gender. But clearly this is to force the hands of men because they're the ones who dominate. So what does this translate to? It means that, for example, when there's a list, the, the list of ambassadors comes out, um, a, a minimum of a third must be women. When cabinet positions come out, a third must be women. Supreme Court, the highest court in the country, means at least a third must be women, although they just tried to kill one of them last week. But it means women have to be in these spaces. The interesting place is where this quarter hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked because women haven't agreed on how it should be done, and the political establishment, the male-dominated political establishment, has also not been very keen on working out how to implement that a third of our legislature be female. And it's controversial because sometimes, like in Uganda, they, have an, they created new constituencies. You know, you split them and you give women odd new creations, and then the elections for women constituencies happens after the main one. Um, people don't usually turn up, you know. And then um, in other countries, it's just a president decides who, who, will, 
people go into the legislature and they create a list out of thin air, and so women outside of the legislature cannot identify with the women in the legislature because that quota isn't working for them. And then also, if it's not supported by grassroots efforts in education, healthcare, it doesn't mean much. Um, but I think it is important for something to be in place because even in Scandinavian countries, there have been artificial ways of creating those numbers of women at the top. Like they'll use party lists, you know, some have laws that mandate, you know, so that they're, they're not all, but there are Scandinavian countries that have those, they have those manipulations of the political process. In the United Kingdom, the party that has the most women in the legislature, Labour, has a list, party list system as well. So it does appear that there needs to be some of this and in more context than others. So my question is, because you seem to see in Spain and Argentina, there is success beyond the quarter. So maybe you could tell us what it is they're doing there and how they have implemented the quota system in Spain and Argentina, and do you see potential application elsewhere? Yeah, um, um, yeah about this quota system. Um, this, uh, <coughs> your statistics were uh, from 2000. Only, and if you went a little bit behind that um, and included Yemen, uh, you could see that they, they were uh, a prominent number of uh, female MPs in, in southern Yemen, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the thing is that um, uh, during that period, um, there was a particle uh, or sort of uh, quota system, meaning that the women's union had the right to nominate their own representatives there. So I'm saying that this quota thing is a is little bit more complicated and, and you have to always take a look at who is nominating the, the candidates, who, who is using this right to uh, apply the, the woman card sort of in, in politics. And I understand that uh, your criticism uh, about this um, UIE about putting so many women there has to do with this very s same thing that um, what is the constituency of these women who are nominated? Are they only femocrats, sisters and wives of uh, prominent chefs? Or are they really coming from the women's rights movement? Go ahead. Uh, let the uh -huh. discussion go if you don't mind. Uh, I, I just uh, um, a response. I agree on most of what you said. I think we are in the same boat. But in our um, case, constitutions are for decoration, and the institutions are for a show. We have a legislative council that they just doesn't legislate. Pass. Sometimes it is not even discussed in that. So the weakness of the uh, institution um, most of the time makes it not possible. Because most of the time they were totally masculine and they will put that woman aside. Uh, it becomes uh, uh, very difficult for a, a woman to survive a totally masculine which is also a weak institution laboring under a strong um, uh, for women to be in quotas, maybe, maybe it will work where the institutions are strong. They cannot even communicate with each other because there, wa there was no connection between them. They were created to serve certain purposes in, in uh, uh I may uh, um, just add one thing and then I'll get to Abdurrahman. I mean, the Egyptian case, it's interesting uh, to follow up from uh, what Asma is saying. 
Because even though from outside, uh, the government wanted to show that we're putting uh, you know, no quotas, number one, but uh, to, to be able to bring more women in, they put a lot of women in the party list. You know? But the party list was the party list to, that uh, would support whatever CC wanted. So basically, it didn't matter who the women were uh, in that. But the actual elections showed another dynamic altogether, and that is if they had not done that, actually you would have had more women who would, uh, who would have actually been able, if you didn't have a party list at all, you would have had perhaps the same number of women. Because in the most popular areas of the country, uh, the candidates that were sent in were actually women like in Baba, places in Upper Egypt and so on, places that you would not imagine would actually be sending uh, uh, you know, women out of the party list that is independent uh, or in small parties, You're not, not out of the main uh, government-sponsored uh, party list. So I think there's a dynamic here. However, having the quota does something, and that is uh, Egypt doesn't have a quota, but basically the fact that you have so many women in parliament today, whether they are from party or not, has gotten most of the population used to having women in the party. And particularly because there's a, there, were, there are women in that Magdus uh, uh, Shaba um, uh, today who are extremely active and extremely vocal. And so they've gained credibility for other women, you know. And many of them are very popular in the way they talk. You know, they're not exactly the most uh, advanced. Some of them are very educated and seem to be outside of the populace, but others are not. So these other ones are actually the more, the more active and the more uh, successful. So I think it's not a bad idea to have a quota, even though I don't think it works, you're absolutely right. But at least what it does, it gets people sort of used to seeing uh, women, uh, women MPs as something that is normative. And I think this is probably, uh, in my personal opinion, is, is something that is probably necessary. Doctors or lawyers, exactly. women will say they want a man doctor. That is the face of what? Alas, yeah, that's exactly right. Abdurrahman and then Islam. Um, so um, it seems like a persistent problem, but was it always as augmented as it is now? Should we look at uh, maybe other things like maybe the role of colonialism in this, the role of uh, maybe um, uh, globalization in augmenting this kind of issue. Yeah, it, sh it sure has been there from before. Um, but what, uh, what I'm saying is um, maybe um, looking at the roots of where these issues come from. All of the observations I'm hearing here uh, today are very important and I keep thinking to myself as I hear them, where, where is the root, where, do, where is that coming from? And uh, to me, the issue of um, this kind of um, patriarchal, um, I guess, um, environment that, that is uh, surrounding us, um, I think, um, I think it, it, it might have always been there, sure, but um, I don't think it's as augmented as, as we see it now. Where, where, where should we look to see how, um, how, that, how that kind of process happened. Actually, actually if, if I may, you know, actually, um, that makes a lot of sense because actually I personally see the state as stopping the, 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 the advancement of women. I think, I think in many cases by putting women in, uh, in lists uh, to, sh to make a show or the, the, you know, what you have with the Emirates is very interesting because as I said, it looks like the spectacle. They give them a bunch of uh, ministries to make it look like they, you know, we have women in everything. But in actual fact, the state uh, or you know business classes or whoever dominates the uh, the political structure or if it's the military or whatever really uh, do, uh, do not really want the uh, radicalization of women except for selected women. So I think that's part of the patriarch, and one should look at this whole structure as actually being part of the state patriarchal system and holding on to it. And that's that's uh, I'm sorry. That's exactly what I, why I was asking the question because. Um, when you said spectacle earlier, that's all I've been thinking about when I saw um, the, uh, the numbers. Because it feels as if um, the participation is only limited to uh, kind of show um, that we do have uh, women participating, and that's it. To get um, maybe um, uh, the Western overlords, if you wish, uh, off our backs. Um, uh, see, we see we are developed. We are we are making women participate. Get off our backs. So, and in that sense, it feels like spectacle. But where is that coming from? If not from this kind of um, 
a socially constructed environment that is completely patriarchal. Your next paper, I think. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, when you sit next to me, I don't see your hand. That's her answer, and then I'll get to follow up on this point. Um, even where it's not spectacle, where it's not quotas and pointed to particular positions, where it's a genuine popular election, as in the case of Pakistan and Benazir Bhutto, um, I think we need to step back and question, as Phoebe was hinting, uh, to what extent does that mean that this is a friendly society? Um, and does it really accomplish anything as far as the gender question is concerned? So women like Margaret Thatcher, like Benazir Bhutto, stand at the, at the intersection of many cross-cutting interests, class interests, and cultural interests, etc. So when I see a Benazir Bhutto elected by popular support, Muslim, um, I see a Zamindar, a member of the landlord classes, I see an Oxford-educated elite. Um, I see someone who, like Margaret Thatcher, represented in many ways right-wing, um, classist, and dare I say patriarchal impulses. Um, so the fact that a culture is open to having women in positions of power is not a necessary indicator of the fact that it's necessarily more progressive on the question of gender in general. and then uh, I don't know your name I'm sorry well I agree that I mean uh, these quotas are for a show or for the spectacle and also hiring um, and appointing certain female ministers for certain positions and just for the show but does this necessarily a bad thing I think that the prevailing culture uh, suggests that women cannot be trusted for such positions. And I think that even if this is a show or even if these quotas are not really uh, helping, I mean, they do help in changing this culture because certain women, certain women when, they, uh, when they claim such positions in the government, they can leave precedent, they can leave legacy that would change this culture of uh, seeing women as uh, not, I mean, cannot be trusted for such positions. And as much as dictators or regimes tend to shape institutions in specific ways to control them and tend to control these institutions, these institutions develop a life of their own as well. I mean, and the bureaucracy evolves some, uh, in certain cases in ways that does not, uh, I mean, that are not favored by the state or by, by the regime. So yes, these might be spectacles, these might be just for the show, but I think that they are still, I mean, important or uh, vehicles for a change in the culture of perceiving women as uh, not, uh, not tr and cannot be trusted for such positions. Okay, Reina, I'll give you Phoebe, but we're running out of time. So altogether, we have to wrap up in about five minutes to get to your paper. Reina, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the informative uh, presentation. But I'm a little uh, interested in this uh, whole issue of why women do not vote for women. And uh, uh, I think the main point there is uh, the issue of education. And uh, have we actually tried to understand female literacy or aspects of education, uh, including uh, you know, curriculum of uh, gender in the policy and planning uh, formulations, uh, which perhaps can go a very long way in uh, trying to bring in you know, empowerment and issues of uh, gender. So has there been any study or what is your take on uh, issues of education? In the, in the context of uh, the paper that you have presented. That's the last question. Another quick comment. Maybe there'll be a question somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, to, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. What's your, sorry? Okay, so to Abderrahman's question on patriarchy and regional culture. Um, you know, the, the book that came to my mind is Leila Ahmed's um, Islam and Gender, or is it Women and Gender and Islam? And I think it's an interesting book because it goes very far back in time. And she tries to give us a big picture, um, deep time approach to cultural changes in this region. And she also, blurs that line of Western liberal culture, Eastern oppressive culture. So for example, in Egypt, culture from 3,100 to 
333 CE before the Greeks came. And she shows how, yes, it's, it's, uh, uh, Egypt was ruled mostly by men. It was patriarchal in many ways, but it was also very liberal. Women could transact business, they could own property. It was more liberal um, than Greece. It's only when the Greeks arrived there in 333 BCE that they start to change it to resemble their own conservative attitudes towards women. And she discusses similar changes, different mixes in the Middle East, and so on and so forth. And the reason why I bring that book up is what are we seeing now? These, these um, Emirati efforts to bring in women, you know, Saudi shot up on that interparliamentary union ranking of countries from the bottom, now they're at 90 something in one year. And I think it's mostly economics. We are seeing oil prices going down and these countries are half, having to think about how they're going to run their economies in the post oil world. They are feeling pressures that they never felt before. And if you're a Saudi government official, you're thinking, if we are going to cut government subsidies, um, we are going to need more women in the workplace to take the pressure of men. So we need to let them drive. Um, we need to think about how the social contract between the ruling and the ruled can hold in a post-oil world. Maybe it's time we put some women up there to actually get our citizens used to seeing women in positions of power. Because I do agree, there's value in both substantive representation and what usually theorists refer to as descriptive representation. Putting women there and getting society used to seeing them, it will also prepare them to see women in other spaces as well. So I don't think um, you know it's something necessarily unique, and you know the fact that culture has been changing here for millennia means it will continue to change. You know that's what I think. And you have about one minute to go. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, it's impossible to to comment on everything. My main my main point or conclusion here is that the nature of the political system is what determines the way in which women can do something uh, or not. And the nature of the political changes in all these uh, regimes or countries, where these changes coming from. Uh, here in the region, in the Middle East, uh, generally speaking, if we see the changes that took place in the last 20 years, they were always because of something that happened somewhere else. Uh, the occupation of Iraq, uh, September 11, Arab Spring, they all had an impact in the society. Whether they mobilized some kind of change from, from below, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but most of the changes were imposed from top down. I mean, as a way to prevent more things to happen or changes or whatever. Uh, so it's not of, as a result of something coming from below. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this is the correct explanation about the Argentina and the Spanish case, but in both cases, the reform of the constitution or the new constitution or the, the new political systems were the result of something that happened in, inside the country. I mean, after having a very hard authoritarian uh, experience, then the societies started to change progressively. Uh, and gender equality was one of these ways to demonstrate that the societies were moving to a more democratic and open and free and equal uh, society. So this is one of the aspects. Uh, if the changes are imposed from the power, saying, okay, I will give you five ministers, I will, give, I will put th 30 women in the parliament, whatever, and not as a result of uh, real pressure from, from below, I don't think this will change. Because as you said, I mean, the patriarchic uh, character of this is showing us that if we appoint someone here, it's because it's the wife of someone or the husband of uh, the daughter of someone. And I am sure that all the names that we know and the several ministries in, in the GG context at least, they are relate, relative to someone. So uh, with this 
political system based basically on criteria that are not gender equal, equal at all, but are related to families, tribes, uh, other criteria to determine who is powerful in every society, I don't think we, we can have any, any, any other further change in that, uh, in that, in that sense. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is that women, I mean, and this is also happening in developed societies, and even in Spain or in Argentina, in the United States, every time a woman is running for an office or is actually occupying a, a, an elected position or appointed position, the way in which everybody is scrutinizing her uh, behavior is absolutely different than in which we do it with the man. Every time Margaret Thatcher, Gondolisa Rice, Madeleine Albright, President Christina Kirchner in Argentina, they were in their positions, we didn't look at them as the president. We look at them as a women that is a president, a woman is a the president. Uh, even in Argentina, even though they voted for, for Christina Kirchner, you cannot believe the way in which they refer to her, uh, the insulting way they refer to her. Much even, uh, even much more harder than anything they say to any my men in the same position. So the expectations to women, okay, let's see how she does it. Not what we expect from a president that is a, a male president or a king or an emir or whatever. That's okay, let's see how he does it or not. If a woman is not performing 120% uh, possibilities, uh, we are not going to choose her again because she didn't perform very well. Did you see how the other 25 males perform? <laughs> well, but this is not that important because we were all looking at the woman. Uh, as far as we don't change the way, and I think of course it's education, as far as we don't uh, change the way in which regard women in office, like it's not a woman, it's a person like another person, we will not, uh, I don't think we will say, uh, we will see that. Yeah, humble opinion. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you very much. Very much. So I have four main parts. First, there's a quick economic overview of Borno, where the, the kidnapping of these girls happened. And then I have a, an, a retreat to the colonial era for some historical contextualization of the political economic problems of independent Nigeria. And then I look at uh, political economic shortcomings of the governments that um, ruled Nigeria after independence. And then lastly, what lessons can we learn from this particular incident? My goal is not to focus on um, the kidnapping of the girls in the way that the media did, but to do so with a, a decent contextual background. So Bono is one of the poorest states in Nigeria. Nigeria has a federal system of government and it, is, it was the home of the government secondary school where over 250 girls were abducted in 2014. Um, in early 2012, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics reported that relative poverty was a problem all over the country, but it was particularly worse in northern Nigeria. So for example, in northwest Nigeria, the poverty rate was 77.7%. Um, in northeast Nigeria, which includes Borno, this state where the kidnapping happened, it's 76.3%. In comparison, in southwest Nigeria, poverty is still high, but it's around 59%. So that there is a serious security problem in northern Nigeria is not in dispute. Um, however, there is a need for those in power to exercise a more definitive solution to the Boko Haram problem. This long-term solution means Nigeria's government must see beyond the military suppression of the group. While ideology is certainly a motivating factor for Boko Haram and its followers, and this is where the media tends to focus a lot of attention, you know, ideology, Islam, radicalization, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it would be unfortunate if the government failed to see the region's economic problems as poignant indicators of where the ultimate solution to the North security problems lie. 
economic development and hopefully in a manner that engages women at all levels of the process. So what ails northern Nigeria? So this is the historical context. If you look at the colonial history, in 1914, the British created the colony and protectorate of Nigeria, um, which was largely divided into two administrative units, northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria was administered by a system called indirect rule, the south by direct rule. What is indirect rule? Um, when the British got to northern Nigeria, they saw the centralized hierarchical system of emirate government in northern Nigeria, something that they recognized. And they also didn't have an economic interest in northern Nigeria. So what they did is they preserved those emirates of northern Nigeria, and they superimposed British system of rule over those emirates. This meant that the British administrative authorities used pre-existing emirate structures for government. Northern Nigeria's emirs were forced into positions that turned them into British administrative tools, fighting their wars, collecting their taxes, and implementing colonial policy. For Britain, the system was minimally invasive and cost efficient for a part of the country in which they had limited economic interest. Southern Nigeria, on the other hand, was very important to the British. It had a port in Lagos colony. This is an important business and uh, a commercial center in general. So to control them effectively, the British imposed a more invasive system of government called direct rule. And a lot of people in southern Nigeria had what we call acephalous systems of uh, government. They did not have hierarchical centralized emirates. So what the British did is they created chiefs where these didn't exist. So amongst the Igbo, for example, they created warrant chiefs. And um, the impact of this was it allowed them to control the economy of the economies in this part of the country better, but it also meant women lost out more because, for example, they lost out in southern Nigeria, women tended to control markets. They didn't control them anymore once the British arrived on the scene. So what does this mean? It means by the time Nigeria attained independence in 1960, the South had higher literacy um, rates um, than the North. It also meant that Southerners made inroads into the civil service, academia, medicine, law, journalism, and other professions at rates that were not matched by the North. As a consequence, Southerners dominated the public and private sector of independent Nigeria. An important die had been cast for future disputes that would manifest themselves in post-colonial coups and counter-coups as military leaders from the north and the south, and then later just military leaders from the north fought amongst themselves to control the country's oil wealth. So political and economic practices in post-colonial Nigeria have only widened and worsened these problems. So now this is a part of the discussion that moves on to independent Nigeria and gets us closer to the Chibok incident. The way in which a considerable segment of the Nigerian ruling class has acquired its wealth is problematic to say the least. And this has only compounded Nigeria's inequality problems. Journalist Patrick Atwanya argues that the financial status of several northern Nigerian barons improved greatly thanks to the largesse of Nigeria's former military rulers who dispensed favors by gifting off state-owned oil fields to friends and cronies. And these are pretty substantive gifts. And, in, and in just one example, in 1996, um, Sani Abacha, who was then the president of Nigeria, gave one official, my Deribe, the Obe oil field, as a gift. 500 and million barrels is, is the value of that oil field, given to one person. So you can imagine the inequalities and how societies view these sorts of um, gifts. Such wealth has enriched but a few, and the oil industry being a capital intensive industry in general, offers employment to a very small number of Nigerians, whether they be from the north or the south. 
To make matters worse, in the years following the commencement of oil production in the 60s, Nigeria became a single commodity state at the expense of other viable and vital sectors of the economy, such as agriculture and manufacturing. These shortcomings affected both northerners and southerners, and the latter have also endured problems of insecurity. For example, in the south, in the Niger Delta, you hear very similar problems to what you hear in the north, only that you know, religion is not the context, and the media tends not to find that very interesting. In the latter region, for instance, poverty, in addition to socioeconomic problems brought on by serious oil-related environmental pollution, flared up into community-wide protests in the 90s and inspired the formation of armed militant groups. Nevertheless, the terror and violence that Boko Haram has visited upon northern Nigeria is certainly better covered. After 2000, poverty combined with ideology as well as moral and financial support of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb to destabilize life for many in northern Nigeria. When Boko Haram was established in 2002, it found ready supporters amongst the same population it would terrorize in later years. Those who were angry at and frustrated by the inefficiencies, inadequacies, and sheer corruption and greed of the Nigerian government flocked to the group. The poverty gap between the North and the South added a them versus us dimension to their activities. Frequently, this is just simplified as Christian versus Islam, uh, which is not the case. Furthermore, human rights abuses on the part of the government committed in its attempts to take out the group find even more support for it in the region. Nevertheless, the group lost the goodwill of the base when it became increasingly violent and turned the local populace into the primary object of its violence. Its original leader died in 2009, and the man at the helm at the time of the Chibok attack, Abu Bakr Shekau, is more radical and violent than his predecessor. So even the nature of Boko Haram itself has changed. The negative repercussions of Shekau's group have been felt far and wide and have evidently been made far worse by the funding and training its members have received from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. The Nigerian government has been found wanting seriously in its capacity to tackle northern Nigeria's security problems. As a consequence, daily life for many of northern Nigeria's inhabitants has become one of fear and uncertainty. In the days following the kidnapping of the Chibok girls, it emerged that schools in the area were not operational as a result of Boko Haram's terrorist activities. The girls were at the government secondary school on that day because it had reopened specifically so that they and other students from other schools in the areas that, other than the government secondary school, could sit for their exam. The worries of the authorities were very real and deep, since the group had actually targeted schools in the region and then promptly forced them to shut down. In 2014, for instance, Boko Haram attacked a school in Yobe State, which is to the west of Borno. It killed 29 boys and injured 11. A few months later, in September 2013, the group attacked an agricultural college and killed 40 of its students. Apparently, when the group attacked the school in Yobe, it had spared the girls and ordered them to return home and get married. According to the BBC, there are now analysts who believe that Boko Haram viewed the continued presence of girls in northern schools as an act of defiance and so attacked the Chibok school to punish those who dared to continue oppose it. In the short term, as far as Borno is concerned, Boko Haram succeeded in its war against the education it disapproved of. As months after the attack, schools in the state were all closed and the education of hundreds of thousands of students disrupted. This can only be tragic as in a state that is already in dire economic straits. So now I come to the section of the paper that deals with um, a way forward, if possible. Beyond the military defeat of Boko Haram, how then can the state make sure that economic grievances that contributed to its rise in the north are addressed? 
To start with, there must be a recognition that northern Nigeria's economic problems are in fact Nigeria's economic problems. The corruption that enriched Deribe and his ilk at the expense of a more equitable distribution of the country's oil and gas wealth is an affliction that has wreaked havoc on societies in the north and the south. The only difference is the situation is more serious in the part of the country that has the highest poverty rates. In addition, the problems of Nigeria's single commodity economy have their origins at the center. That is decades of government policies and practices that neglected sectors of the economy that could have employed more people and enabled it to keep a much more varied base of foreign exchange earnings. An example of one such sector is agriculture, and recent government steps to reform this sector hold promise. As Nigeria's former agriculture minister, Akinwumi Adesina, observed, Nigeria in the 60s was producing enough food to sustain itself. However, as the government's attention shifted to oil, the country's agricultural sector was neglected, and it was not long before the country became a net importer of its food. This is in spite of an abundance of cultivable land and good climate in most parts of the country. Consequently, in recent years, an average of $11 billion dollars per annum for a developing country was spent on fish, rice, sugar, which could be produced locally, and wheat imports. I don't, I don't know if wheat could grow there, but you know, the first three definitely can be produced locally. In 2011, the government launched the Agricultural Transformation Agenda to raise food production by 20 million tons a year and create employment for millions of Nigerians. Its four main foresight include improving market access for farmers, boosting logistics of food production by investing in relevant infrastructure, setting up an agricultural insurance scheme, and a privately run system for getting fertilizers to farmers. The system resulted in early successes in these areas, but the government will need to put in a concerted and consistent effort to achieve sustainable food production. In addition, it must incorporate indigenous methods of food production that have proven their effectiveness, such as homegrown dryland management techniques, and the intertwining of animal and crop husbandry well suited for Sahelian regions of northern Nigeria. Where such government programs fail, and if you're from a developing country, you can at any one time think of programs of a similar type that have failed. And, you, and the main reason why they fail is their tendency to overlook the vital and considerable contributions of women to the economic health of their societies, especially in a continent like Africa, where agriculture is the economic base of many countries. And sometimes, you know, figures you see of up to 70% of agriculture being done by women. So when they're not incorporated into these programs, um, that's a, a contributory factor to their failure. An answer to the economic question is vital, and it must center the concerns and lived experiences of women in northern Nigeria for it to succeed. So beyond our concern for the Chibok girls, how do we transfer this concern to girls and women in northern Nigeria in general and their societies? It is important for the international community the Nigerian government and relevant stakeholders to decisively focus, and I'm here I'm quoting Buki Adenekan, who wrote a recent article on the gendered realities of conflict in northern Nigeria. And she says, they must focus on women as valuable agents of change and social mobilizers, with the ability to curb the impacts of violence and environmental degradation. Women's um, 
plights in displacement must be analyzed and addressed with urgency, and women must be included in strategizing, designing, and implementing interventions. So here she's talking about um, conflict and the immediate aftermath. But I would argue that you know women as valuable agents of change and social mobilizers, women as agents of um, ecological protection, in strategizing and designing and implementing in interventions is something that should be pursued in efforts to reform the economy in post-conflict situations. And we have seen women in northern Nigeria mobilizing, you know, for example, uh, the Million Women March in Abuja. There are so many women now who are leading um, households because their husbands and their fathers are not in the picture anymore. They are already carrying an even bigger burden, economic burden, in the current environment. So these are the sorts of capacities, you know, the passions and interests that must be harnessed for the sustainable economic development of northern Nigeria. Uh, finished, thank you. <laughs> this um, conflict has always fascinated me, <clears throat> partly because uh, we are on the mercy of uh, global media, which uh, always um, tends these kind of conflicts in, in, in a peculiar light meaning that we don't get any kind of picture of actually what actually is happening. So uh, leading people to think that it's, it's evil, and, and then of course because it's Muslims, it must be evil. So, but um, um, therefore I have two questions, and um, the first question is that um, I understand that this uh, economical background that you <coughs> outlined uh, very well, but um, the question is uh, where does violence come from? Well, why is the re uh, response to this kind of marginalization such harsh violence? And the second question is that uh, what exactly is Boko? Why, why, why is that the Boko is, is something, well, what exactly does it refer to? And, and why is it so dangerous that it has to be violently uh, resisted? Uh, this is a continuation of the question asked by uh, Susan. Because in Iraq and Syria, what we see that there is like an international implication um, um, in supporting terrorist groups in, in both countries. And it has something to do with oil. You know, I mean... It's so weird to see, you know, these groups uh, holding tight to the oil wells, for example, in areas like in Syria and also in, in Iraq. Uh, do you have the same situation, Ian? Is Boko Haram is related to any international imperial power or it is just a homegrown terrorism in, uh, in Nigeria? Um, one thing just to uh, respond to, to his last uh, point is that last year we had a visit from uh, the former president of Nigeria, Obusanjo, and uh, he was talking about issues that I think really dovetailed with what uh, Phoebe identified in terms of the economic deprivation as as reasons for so much of the radicalization that happened with the Boko Haram, and how uh, we said, yeah, far more complicated picture, but that is a great part of it. It's a kind of people, you know, have nothing to lose, <laughs> and that you are dealing with a group that they feel, okay, they are in a no-win situation. But my, this is just a quick comment, but my question for, to Phoebe, uh, if you were to continue on, on this project uh, and try to look at the girls who came back, some of them actually came back with children. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, what do you think 
is going to, uh, in, in terms of the debates, some had already expressed the Stockholm syndrome, where they said that they were ambivalent, now they have babies, whether the release was indeed a good thing that happened. So would you consider, for example, continuing this paper and looking at before, during, and after the abduction? Is that something that would be of interest? I have a question about the, the economic status of uh, the warriors, if you... Economic, sorry? The economic status. Oh, okay. okay. Because uh, in many occasions, and specifically within these Islamic... We always talk about poverty and how it drives those people who... If you look at them, they are doctors, they are engineers, they are poets, they are... The, the society? What gives? <laughs> Ask my question, but I also want to make a comment that I think uh, we find that there are a lot of people who are on the periphery, that is, those who um, maybe are not poor, but somehow expected more and therefore, or they're coming from poverty, expected more, but found blocks that being on the periphery revolutionizes. We've seen this consistently with thinkers and so on. And I think it's probably the same with a lot of the, uh, the, the young doctors, etc. If we look at their f uh, family backgrounds, and then the jobs, and then the disappointments, and so forth, this basically radicalizes them. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I have a question. Uh, to add and actually following up on some of the questions that were um, asked earlier. Um, do you see Boko Haram and also the other groups in Africa? Because this is really an African question, so it goes to Africanists. Do you, do you see them now as the new caliphate, the heirs? Some people have actually pointed to Sorry? new the new caliph, the, the callers for the new caliphate, now that oh, oh, ISIS okay. has failed oh, oh, in the oh. east and that, uh, you know, from Mauritania and the different groups that are coming out and, and actually calling for the caliphate. And how close was the connection anyway between these groups and between ISIS? There's so much great similarities between them uh, that, uh, you know, one wonders, uh, I mean, going back to the interest in oil wells and so on that uh, Islam is asking, yeah, I mean, it's the same tactics, the same things, you know, coming into Libya, coming into... Uh, so what are we lo really looking at? I'm sorry that Islam left because I know he works on these things. But basically, uh, uh, from an African uh, perspective, uh, I know we're both not political scientists, so maybe this is out of uh, our league, but there must be something we should be looking at there. It's bigger than just... Uh, it's the whole Sahara involved. It's no longer borders. It's... This, uh, Baya's idea that it should be expanding, there may be something more there than what we're looking at. It isn't just, and even if you go back to um, you know, the, the Mahdi of Sudan, he was also talking the same thing, and it, the borders didn't exist for him. That's the, that's the impact of, uh, of al-Mahdiya, is that it went across borders, and that's why the British came and crushed it so badly because it became that sort of frightening sort of, uh, sort of uh, supra movement. So I, I don't know, uh, I, I'm out of my league here, but I keep on having these questions. What's going on here? I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, really very sure. The other thing is, um, uh, in the case of the women of Boko Haram, it's in particular, and the kind of violence you referred to, we also see it in ISIS. We also see it in the treatment of women in Saudi Arabia. I mean, the spectacle of getting a woman out in the street and, and, uh, and uh, beheading her in front of everybody, just so demeaning and so incredible while she's screaming and it's all over the net and they don't care, they do it over and over again, not misstanding anybody telling them, I hope this ends now, if they really are interested. This, this severity of using the, the helpless, because this is what we are, to show perhaps male superiority. Even the image in Sudan of this uh, journalist being whipped, you know, and making sure that it's on all the media so everybody would know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 an educated journalist woman was whipped because she had to wear jeans, you know. 
Um, so what is it that we're looking at? I mean, this is sort of um, an intentional symbol of uh, violence against women to create a patriarchal power, to re-emphasize uh, something that is really out of their control because women today are out of, I, maybe you can theorize about this for us from the, from the perspective of Boko Haram. Okay. I'll try. Uh, uh, excuse me, I still have more. Yes, yes. Um, Arabia, I teach Osman Don Fodio in Nigeria, and I teach the Diobandis in South Asia. And so, yes, I think there's an intellectual legacy here fleshed out um, and connected more widely to broader currents in the Islamic world and not just Africa. But yeah, I'd be curious to see how much we draw on this thing. Uh, uh. Exactly, they're not mm. apart from the intellectual participation. Apart from intellectual yes, participation. Yes. Yeah, no, but it's it would be interesting to see how, where, how they conceive of gender. The Abbey movement, for example, uh, we know very well how they conceive of them, um, almost by omission rather than by inclusion. But so it'd be interesting to see whether it's the same in this and how closely these activists from Boko Haram but, but actually draw on this. this and and uh, what that's my saying is, I think, is extremely important because th th this is very male. You know, it's almost like, you know, the old Morabits, you know, Morabitu. And said it was always a male movement. It's almost like the Crusaders, you know, <laughs> that it's uh, the, the saint to whatever. You know, the, basically, it's, they're all male military sort of organizations and part of it is actually violence to women and keeping women out so I'm, i mean is there's something there to look at or not but it, it's, it seems to be that we are seeing this uh, this pattern and and as phoebe was talking you know i, I yeah yes there's interest in oil the interest is in money and that's part of it 100 uh, percent and perhaps this is the way to cement is by making it very male and very anti-female uh, anti to try to get this brotherhood, you know, the idea of a brotherhood, you know, that the separate the brotherhood, it seems to be consistent, you know, through, throughout. Uh, it was just released by Benjamin uh, Lawrence to talk about uh, just branching out, also, also the idea of the uh, blurred boundaries and the disappearance of the idea of the border, uh, that uh, pretty much they did you know, uh, announce and plead allegiance to us, that they are going to carry the mission wherever, just maybe. And in the same way as is Shabab, I think um, Phoebe's work also in that area, in uh, the Somali Shabab, very, very similar in terms of the male centeredness oh, yeah. of the. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's These are all now. very good <laughs> questions. I'll try. I'll do my best to answer them. You know, you don't have to respond so. to all because a lot of these were comments, so you may want to pick what you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, to what exactly is Boko Haram? Well, the, the reality is there are lots of definitions out there about who Boko Haram is. And I would say it's not surprising that there are so many definitions because if you look at, um, say, modern African history, say, if you go back to 1900 or so moving forward and you look at militant movements, not just in the Islamic world, but you know, in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, uh, usually even to this day, you will still have scholars debating, you know, what exactly was ANU-PF? What exactly was the Mau Mau? People don't often have uh, an agreement, a solid definition of who they are. But broadly speaking, it uh, formula, formally established itself around 2003, 2002. That's when uh, Mohammed Yusuf announced himself. And he's a Salafist. Um, and, you know, um, the, the movement, though, at the, under the, the rule of Mohammed Yusuf, yes, it was violent but not the kind of violence that we have come to associate with Abu Bakr Shekau. So the movement itself has morphed. 
Um, in terms of uh, where does the violence come from? Again, I really don't think we can link the violence that we see uh, with Boko Haram uh, with even that conservative Salafist context or Islam in general. And let me, let me say, tell you why I think so. If you look at Southern Nigeria, for example, a majority of Southern Nigerians uh, have a Christian heritage or they have a heritage of um, indigenous African religions that have nothing to do with Christianity or Islam. Now, if you think back to the 1990s, when there was a lot of disruption in the Niger Gen uh, Delta, and some of you may remember a man called Kenule Sarowiwa, who established a group called the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, it cost him his head and the head of about nine other leaders of, of Mosul. And yet Mosul wasn't necessarily violent. They, they did have a, a, a culture of civil protest and riots and yes, violence, but not the sort of violence we would associate, for example, with um, uh, with Boko Haram. So someone may say, oh, well, Mosop was different. Well, I would like to give them another example, namely the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, which has been violent, it has had kidnappings, it has had sabotage, and not just sabotage that has disrupted oil uh, lines in southern Nigeria, but uh, sabotage that has led to massive tragedies when these oil spills light and burn their own communities. So we've had um, you know, violent movements in southern Nigeria as well without an Islamic um, heritage or Salafist anything. And, but I think um, it's also the world that we are living in the world we are living in is a post 9-11 world. When you add Islam to the mix, it gets better media coverage. You know, it's, the, it's, it's, it's to some extent, it's what uh, the major media organizations of the world are drawn to, as opposed to movements that do not have that sort of base, but are just as, as violent like men. Okay, um, to the question about um, the international implications of terrorist support groups and, you know, are there any linkages to oil? You know, I think we have to retreat to, again, to the, 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 the recent past of, of Nigeria. And what do we see in Nigeria post 1960s? If you look at the works of, of people like Toyin uh, Falola, for example, um, the, the, the research that they've done shows us that when Nigeria comes to independence, it comes to independence with considerable international interest in the economy of the post-independent state, precisely because oil had just been discovered shortly before 1960s. So the British had their eye on, Britain, on, on, on Nigeria, the French had their eyes on um, Nigeria, and this feeds into um, the, the political environment of post-independent Nigeria. And we see this most clearly in the Biafran War of Secession in southeastern Nigeria. There's a reason why the, Brit the French sided with the secessionists and the British were against the secessionists and encouraging the Nigerian government to squash it and continue to encourage them to do that without any definitive address of the sorts of uh, motivations that led to that secession in the first place. So Nigeria became a country of weak institutions, of coups and counter coups, and even after it emerged into what is now a civilian state that has held more or less, you know, 
Um, if you look at the, how often the coups were happening and the stretch we have now had from the 90s to the present under civilian rule, you know, more or less, you know, the most stable period in terms of broad political patterns um, of its history. But what is the, one of the constant features of post-colonial Nigeria are uh, the interests of oil companies like Shell, you know, um, so you'll remember seeing those Mosso posters of go shell, go to hell. You know, there was so, so much civil organization protest, not just against the state, but the oil companies. And some of the sabotage um, activities, you know, when they cut those oil pipelines, it's not just because they, um, they, they want to disrupt the state and bring attention to themselves, it's because these were communities that were fishing communities, there were agricultural communities, but now you have these rivers that are dead, they can't fish anymore, land that is not cultivable, and oil is not an employer. Oil doesn't ever generate employment. Oil generates money that it can generate projects such as these, like Education City and whatnot, that can then generate employment. Oil in and of itself never generates employment. So you have people who are completely divorced from um, the formal economy of Nigeria. And so international role, the, the international community has had this interest uh, in, in its oil wealth. And of course, in, there was a huge stretch between 1960s and the 1990s when a lot of African countries found themselves privy to you know, Cold War allegiances, and that also played a role, particularly in the tolerance of military regimes in Nigeria. As long as they were not leaning left, it's okay. It doesn't matter who they're hanging, who they're murdering. It, it really doesn't matter as long as internationally you are leaning towards the West. So that has played a role, and we see it today in you know, the weak institution that the independent state has. So that has, I would say it has played a role. And then uh, the question, Rogaya's question on returnees and the fate of their societies. I think it's an interesting thing. I haven't looked into it much. Um, and um, I remember when the first lot of Boko Haram girls returned um, from Nigeria, uh, to me, one of the most comforting things was a man, I saw this on Al Jazeera, was a man being so happy to see his daughter and really welcoming her, and, and this, regardless of the fact that she had come back with a child. And I thought that's promising, but I don't know what the future will be. I think for me, the, the, the model the, the closest model would be the Ugandan case study of the Aboke girls, because in the 90s you had a kidnap of about 139 girls um, by Joseph Korn's LRA forces. And you see LRA, Lord's Resistance Army, a re violent extremist conservative movement with a Christian heritage that wants to institute the Ten Commandments. You know, so this, this, this to me, uh, that's why, again, this is a different country. We're not talking about southern Nigeria anymore, but we see another movement, a violent movement, that doesn't have an Islamic heritage. So, again, weak institutions, an authoritarian state, international community has tolerated Yoweri Museveni for a long time because best option in the Cold War world, you know, he was leaning to the West. Um, and, you know, the man himself is a ruthless ruler. And you, it's like you're culturing bacteria. You know, you have these sorts of environments that breed a lot of discontented, disenfranchised people that then find articulation in movements such as the LRA, MAND, MOSOP, um, and, you know, most spectacularly Boko Haram, you know. 
Um, so I would say a model would be the girl, Aboke girls. They are Aboke girls, the Ugandan government sponsored their education. Some have gone on to university, gotten an employment. So in terms of the girls themselves, I would say that provides a model. But it's not enough to just look after the girls because we have to think about their homes and their families and the, their futures 15, 20 years from today. And that's where you know, economic reform on a larger scale becomes a pertinent issue. So yeah, I would, I would mention that. Um, and then um, Asma's question on uh, economics, you know, you, you have these societies that, yes, um, you do have doctors, you do have people like my Deribe, you know, very wealthy people in northern Nigeria, but I would say that's a, a minority. Uh, what about the vast majority, you know, those 77% who are living under the poverty line? That is the tinder, I would say. That's the tinder that provides um, uh, the raw materials for people like Abu Bakr Shekau. It's, it makes it easier for them to recruit. And as I said in my presentation, um, when they first, Mohammed Yusuf, he had a pretty easy time recruiting because the local population welcomed Boko Haram. They welcomed it because it was another outlet for them to protest against misgovernment and the misappropriation of national resources. So this was an outlet, they welcomed it, and then it, the group alienated them by their grotesque violence, and so that has increased some distance. So, yes, most definitely, you know, Northern Nigeria does have its luminaries, you know, its uh, academic elite and so on and so forth, uh, but, you know, the, pic the broad picture isn't a very pretty picture, unfortunately. And then... Um, to Amira's question, do I see broad patterns, you know, the, the new caliphate, the borderlessness of these movements, and so on and so forth? Um, I, I, I think, yes, definitely there's a borderlessness. Um, I don't know of any links uh, more deliberately between Boko Haram and ISIS, but they certainly have taken a lot of inspiration from ISIS, even if you look at their iconography and what have you. The links that I've seen established in you know, papers that people have done is between Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. But I do think that as ISIS was in ascendancy in the Middle East, it became an attractive, um, a another attractive group out there for them to attach themselves to in some way. Now, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb was initially established... Isn't, isn't the leader to, of uh, uh, Boko Haram also Azhar educated? I, I don't know about yeah, his I education. He is, he's a graduate of the Azhar. So oh, I, okay. I think there is a connection. doesn't mean that it translates exactly the same, but it's... Uh, so I don't know. Anyway. I, I do think um, ideology plays a role, and I think this has been highlighted most recently with the, um, the blockade here. Um, you had Saudi Arabia leaning very heavily on certain countries like Senegal, where it has been pouring money for the construction of mosques, you know, um, educating um, uh, religious leaders and so on. And there have been arguments that they are radicalizing uh, certain African societies. The interesting thing, though, is that sometime, a few weeks ago, uh, the Senegalese government called the Emir of Qatar, and I think they've now returned the ambassador. But that whole incident acted to, I, I think, um, highlight the homogenization of religious thought in certain parts of Africa, and it does play a role in radicalization. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb was initially set up to oppose the Argentinian government, to try and um, unseat the Argentinian government and replace it with an Islamic state. Um, it, it, obviously, it hasn't worked, but then, you know, they've had successes with the destabilization of Libya, for example, um, and, and Libya also, you know, Gaddafi had also you know, played this ideological game uh, with with his um, unseating. You then had a lot of Tuaregs 
who had moved to Libya from countries like Mali and Chad, now moving back across the, the desert, places like uh, Mali, where they've caused a, a different set of disruption that I hadn't mentioned, but they've also played a role in places like northern Nigeria. So there is some borderlessness in, in that regard, but I also don't think we should lose um, perspective of the particular local conditions that um, allow these global movements to take root in certain places. So um, the sort of environment that has cultivated al-Shabaab is very different from the sort of environment that is cultivating, um, you know, Boko Haram, you know. So I think those local environments, we shouldn't lose perspective of, of them as well. Um, and then um, had the question, there's a, a question I'm leaving about gender violence, the, the focus on gender violence. That I find interesting. I don't have an answer for it. Because if you look at violent movements like men, you don't, they don't have this, um, you know, this tendency to target women um, and, and to target them in the ways that we have seen with Boko Haram. But just again, I want to caution, because we've seen Lord Resistance Army do the same thing. And actually, the Lord Resistance Army did has done things that I haven't seen Boko Haram do. Um, I haven't seen Boko Haram cutting the lips of women or cutting their ears off. Um, I, haven't, I haven't quite seen that. The mass rapes that has been Lord's Resistance Army with its Christian heritage. So I'm really very cautious about how people apply this um, Islamic heritage. Uh, we, we have to be very cautious. It, it's something that the media has fueled, but I, I feel, again, it, it causes us to lose touch of you know the the particular problems in different African countries that are then you know allowing these movements to take place. Fanatics and are then, the same across the board. Sorry, fanatics are the same in any religion, any. Yes, they can be as ruthless. Um, and and you know I I still shiver when I see Lord's Resistance Army's cruelties, I and mean, they've done some really ugly things. But the Abok girls are similar to the two. Yes, yes, and you know same. That's why I think it's a very good uh, counterpoint. You know. And then to Reem's question about Usuman Danfodio and revivalist movements, and I think this will also apply to the points you raised about the Mahdi in Sudan, 1880s, 1890s. The intellectual legacy, I think, is a complicated one because even when you look at Usuman Danfodio, um, he, his daughter was very well educated, wrote a lot of poetry and so on and you know she's not very well known in in contemporary um, uh, historical studies but you know she was a leader she was an intellectual leader with her own output her own intellectual output some of which has been translated and preserved in in collections so uh, um, that's that's one thing one, one complication there the other thing is I don't know if it's because of his daughter or just the general outlook. Usman Danfodio himself said some really gender-friendly things about women. You know, that you shouldn't just be in the home. Women have a mind that should be cultivated and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that's an interesting way to think about Usman Danfodio. Another interesting way to think about um, uh, uh, Islam and uh, uh, and women in Africa is, is Senegal. Um, the the former prime minister of Senegal, her, her name escapes my mind, but she was asked by a journalist. Actually, she was an Al Jazeera journalist. Obviously, I, but you know the thing is, Al Jazeera covers Africa in a way that CNN <laughs> and BBC does not. But there was a really in interesting interview that an Al Jazeera journalist did with the former prime minister of Senegal. And he asked her, how do you explain uh, the sort of political engagement we see in, among Senegalese women? 
And believe it or not, she linked it to Senegal's culture of brotherhoods. And yes, and, and you know, when you look at Senegal's culture of brotherhoods and the marabouts, you know, you, you see very masculine organization, but according to her, it has allowed women a lot of room for spiritual expression. Some of them have ascended to um, positions of influence within these brotherhoods. And you know, she had this whole argument about how they've encouraged education and also the grassroots um, changes in society and so on and so forth. But there are actually many schools of thought about um, Senegal's brotherhoods. You have some scholars who say that brotherhoods simply perpetuate broader gender biases and so they actually work against women. So there, I, I should acknowledge that there is a, a counter argument um, to, to that particular argument. But she said that's actually a contributory factor to the sort of participation we are seeing in modern day Senegal because um, Yes, uh, the marabouts in Senegalese culture uh, have a lot of weight. It's impossible to win elections in Senegal if you do not have the support of the marabouts. It's impossible. So if you, women are able to cultivate a space within these marabouts, it, it has a lot of significance outside of the brotherhood. So that's what the former prime minister was trying to argue. So I think in general, it, it gives us a sense that um, the environment might be more complicated uh, than we understand because Islamic societies that have as many, as we all know, as many complications, human societies are complicated everywhere. I do understand the borderless com uh, context and you know people link the the Mahdi of Sudan. They usually say, well, there were also revivalist movements going on in in the Middle East at that time, and we should not just look at the Mahdi and Sudan in particular. So I, that that does play a role as well. I don't so think I think a this would be a confluence though, uh, because yeah? uh, if you even look at the uh, the great uh, it's always been big, you know the the real big orders. So I think this is part of the culture and the tradition. There's always that sort of, um, you know, let's say dream world or the ability or the, the messianic thing is to create the borders. So the marabouts are also a form of, uh, of, uh, of Sufism, the, because uh, Sufis uh, are very political. You know, we, we always look at very religious, but they're really very political. Uh, the Mahdeya was like that. I mean, most of the, uh, the Sunuseya, all the big, uh, um, are, are quite similar, and I'm, I'm suggesting here, and I'm, I'm not an expert here, suggesting that uh, that's the format that people like the Boko Harams and the ISIS, etc., are taking because that's what's familiar to them, and yet they're completely anti-Sufi. You know what I mean? They're they're not really Sufi orders, but they are really uh, the experience they have is that sort of uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, supra-border uh, movements. It's, it's familiar to the tradition, you know. I agree. They see um, Sufist movements as their biggest enemies because they they are very uncomfortable with doctrinal diversity, and that's what you find in a place like Senegal. Although you know Saudi Arabia has been there and is changing things, uh, but originally you know that doctrinal diversity is something that yes, uh, these Salafist movements have been very much afraid of. So yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. We don't have any time left, but uh, maybe anybody would like to make final comments. To, to the you want to get out of here, I know. Tired. Yeah, we can finish it, but maybe before we go, maybe some of our, uh, you know, our guests here may have some final uh, uh, conclusions. Thank everybody for making the time consecutive investment in this conversation and we hope that we get together again for uh, to continue some of the thoughts that came to Firstly, I'm, uh, I'm very gratified because uh, in these last two days when we talked about gender violence, we talked about gendered violence uh, out of the norm. 
this year. I mean, we, dis we, we actually touched on all the, uh, the usual forms of gender violence, including, you know, domestic violence. But basically, we have really spoken about many topics that are not normative. I have to go back and process all of that. But there's just a lot of uh, uh, forms of violence that we discussed in the last two days that normally are not. And this is my, why my question to you about, about uh, colonization as a form of gender violence. Because I think that the discourse on gender violence has become stigma, you know, uh, stagnant within the CDAO and other frameworks, you know, the sort of the usual frameworks. I'm all for, by the way. But I'm just saying that for our part of the world, maybe what we needed to do uh, is to expand and bring and begin talking a discourse of gender violence that is uh, that expands the meaning and expands this for us to even be able to as where do we go that asked uh, that question that we need to widen the, uh, the discussion to other areas and i think it should be widened to gender in the sense of including the men and the children as well and not and uh, and not just focus on uh, on a particular group uh, that is, that is the, because the violence doesn't only hit the, the women, number one, but also uh, if it's uh, my pet uh, projects, I would say also the, not the, the, our friends on four, f uh, who walk on four rather than two. So b b basically our uh, animal populations as well. I mean, there's violence, there's a culture of violence. So I think it's pretty, it's, it's, it was very interesting that we touched on different forms of violence that are not normative. And I think maybe this is the direction if we are going to get a, a hawa out or, you know, a publication or even put it on our net, uh, our uh, web page, is to show it what we did here in the terms of what we try to do is to, if we are all in agree agreement to this, uh, uh, or send me your comments, because uh, it's, it's, it's pretty important for us to show, uh, you know, where we should go. And I think this is what we managed to do in the last two days, and that is to widen uh, the, the, the discussion on gender violence. Um, thank you very much. This was a wonderful two days.